call us to order. Um, I hope this is picking up. And uh, the meeting is called to order at 6.30 p.m. I note uh, Councillor Brown is unable to be here tonight. And, uh, and Councillor Palin, if you would just uh, identify yourself. Hello, everyone. Uh, Pitting Cone District 2. Great. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> I'll talk about meeting logistics a little bit. Anyone joining remotely, I'd appreciate it if you would change your name on, on your display to your first and last name. Anyone who wishes to speak must be uh, recognized. And we ask you to start by stating your name and where you live. Uh, we ask you to keep your questions or comments to three minutes, and we will have the assistance from uh, Ms. Prim uh, to keep track of your time. And uh, from that, we can go ahead uh, with the approval of the agenda. I'll mention a couple of things. We, uh, we had uh, scheduled a presentation by some local business owners, and they were not able to be here tonight, so we'll be uh, invite they'll be coming to a meet next first meeting in June. Um, and in the consent agenda, water and sewer rate setting is pulled out of the consent agenda, and city bot procurement is moved to our next meeting. And the fire chief update, which is item number thirteen, we will move to the end uh, after the other business and council and other reports so that we can move that, go into executive session and then uh, adjourn after that. Tim. Thank you, Presenter Agenda Jack. Wondering um, if maybe we should also pull the local emergency management plan off, just a little sure. bit of conversation on that. Sure, thanks. Okay, any other uh, requests to change the agenda or are we good to go? Okay, we can start with general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda for up to three minutes. And I see we have someone in the room who's uh, looking to be recognized. So why don't you come on up? You hear me? All right. Um, I'm gonna start passing these around. These are. These are handouts that I just put together about a proposal that I want to put out to the city um, and the downtown business community called Change is Good. All right. Um, my might, name is, uh, yeah. That's, is that you're good? just doing what I was about to tell you to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My name is Lauren Andrews. I own Capital Cannabis Company and Aeromed Essentials uh, right across the street on Main Street. Um, I uh, have been quite inspired by uh, an effort up in the Burlington area from the Church Street Market, something called, uh, they call it positive change. And what they've done is they've had uh these receptacles where people can make change donations. And over the years, they've raised over $20,000 for COTS um, up in the Burlington area. And I believe that there's a need for that here in Montpelier. And there's a lot of support around the downtown business community to do something like this. Um, the, really, the purpose of the Change is Good is to fundraise for nonprofits that uh, assist some of our more vulnerable community members, people who are unhoused, food insecure, uh, suffering from mental illness or from addiction. And what we would do is we'd want to create three secure artisanally created metal drop boxes where locals and visitors can leave donations. Um, and we're thinking maybe three throughout the city uh, outside of high traffic areas where there's a lot of foot traffic and basically money with that would be collected, uh, would be collected monthly. It would go to a local nonprofit like Another Way or the Food Pantry or Good Samaritan Haven. Um, I have spoken with folks over at, um, 
Montpelier alive because it would be necessary for probably for some organization to hold it. I mean, we can get it started. I plan on fundraising around it and doing a um, GoFundMe. So there's no financial burden on the city. I think we've been through enough. I think that there is enough interest out there that I can raise the money and without the city incurring any costs. Um, the only thing that I would need is probably somebody to help uh, put the, maybe have the folks over at the Department of Public Works actually install them so they're secure, they can't be moved, secured to the ground, that sort of thing. Um, and that's what I'm thinking. I think it's just nice to have an option uh, for people to have a little spare change to know that if they put it in those bins, that that money is going to go to uh, nonprofits that actually serve serve the community. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. No. Okay. Well, I just wanted to plant the seed. I don't have any expectation of answers or definitive anything from you, except um, I, like I said, I'm planting the seed. We're going to work toward uh, securing, cementing more details around how to pull it off. And then when we have a final plan, I'd like to bring it back to the council to get your stamp of approval and uh, see if we can maybe raise a little bit of money for these nonprofits. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um. Anybody else in the room who's looking to be recognized? And I think we have at least one person um, in uh, in Zoom land who's looking to be recognized. Elaine, there we go. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Audio is working now. <laughs> um, thanks. Um, I'm Elaine Ball. I live in Montpelier. And... I am here representing Montpelier Pride. Um, I've communicated a bit with the council in the last month about raising pride flags along State Street and Main Street during the month of June, um, as well as declaring Pride Month in Montpelier to be the month of June. And I submitted a draft of a resolution. Um, last year, Mayor McCullough and I raised the flag outside of City Hall and read the um, read the proclamation or resolution. There was a small crowd there and um, it turned out really well. So I would love to have the council support again. I would just note, Eileen, um, and we've communicated about this. Uh, last year, we were happy to do that. And uh, we did get some feedback that in June, particularly June 14 is flag day. And, and we did not have American flags up. So I think our thought this year was we would try to alternate the American flags and the pride flags throughout downtown so that we had American flags right from now, Memorial Day, all the way through to July 3rd, July 4th. But then for June, have the pride flags alternate. And I, I think that's okay with you, right, Elaine? And uh, so that would be the suggestion from staff. Thanks, Elaine. Our... <coughs> You're still there. Yeah. Okay, good. And, uh, and I think we'll have that a resolution on the agenda next time, right? Unless it's a mayoral proclamation, then you can do it whenever you see. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to hog all the credit because I think the whole uh, council supports it. Thank you. It, it certainly was a unanimous um, approval by the council last year, so I really appreciate that. Um, the first day of our Pride festivities kickoff this year is Wednesday the 29th and the um, there's a couple events that Wednesday and Thursday and then the main event at the State House lawn is going to be Friday evening so it technically is the end of May because that's the first weekend in June um, and I'm not sure if there's another council meeting before the 31st but um, yeah it would be great to plan something before then okay we'll get it figured out <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else here for general business and appearances? Not seeing anyone else with a hand raised. So we can move to the consent agenda with the exception of items D, E, and um, it looks like six. Okay, yeah. six. <laughs> Okay, so is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as uh, amended? 
Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Any opposed? All right, we have adopted the consent agenda and you're tracking which ones we haven't done yet, right? All right, I want to talk about the item D, the local emergency management plan. Hello, Chief, thanks for being here. Yes, of course. <clears throat> Question looking it over was, um, and thinking we've got resiliency oh, community, oh, you yeah, want to roll I, it? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to learn more about the development of the local emergency management plan. And, um, you know, I think it's, it looks like it's based on just like a template. And um, I just wanted to learn more about, you know, I was just quickly looking at it today and just wondering, you know, of course, thinking worst case scenarios, right? Like what happens if all the power goes out? Like, is there a phone chain? Like, I don't know if, because it looked like on the, um, you know, when, I'm just pulling it up here so I get the right information. When there is a crisis, is a lot of information is being shared via the web and email, and um, and so I just didn't know, like, what if? I mean, gosh, what if all the power went off? And I didn't know if that was in there. So that was my first question, and my second question was, um, do you ever practice this local emergency plan? Like, is there drills that happen each year? Like. I know in hospitals, they, I know the police department does this. I know hospitals do it, but I wasn't sure if this was actually like practiced and implemented. Okay. So you're absolutely right. It is a template. Okay. It's a, it's, and it's um, put out by uh, Central Vermont Regional Planning and Vermont Emergency Management. It's their plan. And I think what's important to keep in mind is, is the name of it. It's an emergency management plan. It's not an operations plan. It's not a, it's a management plan that we do, we're required. Vermont Emergency Management requires all cities and towns to have this plan and have this plan in place. Some don't, some choose not to, but it would affect, um, one of the reasons we're doing so well with our FEMA funding is because all of our plans are in place. So yes, yeah, so that's the template that we fill out. Um, this year we added, or um, actually Evelyn's uh, crisis communications plan has been added to that plan. And the plan has gone to Central Vermont Regional Planning and VEM, and they both approved it for this year. So you're absolutely right, it is a template that we fill out. And a lot of it is, um, as you know, notice it's probably, uh, an example would have been uh, uh, Hurricane Irene. When they were looking for resources, the VEM could pull those plans, they could pull Montpelier's plan and say, okay, Montpelier has six backhoes that are available. All that stuff's in the plan. Or pull people from the plan. Um, both myself and, at the time, Chief Fakus um, got pulled to work in Waterbury at the um, at the state EOC, and it was based on that plan. They went to the plan. They said, okay, we have two people here who are ICS 400, and they pull us in to work there. So that's what the plan does. And just to, to follow up on that, so the city has a, you know, I think we we talked about, we did our after action plan after the flood, we have the crisis communication plan, we have our own continuity of operations plan. So if something gets knocked out, what's the next thing we do? Um, we do have generators in our key emergency buildings for power, um, but we do practice it, not as much as we ought to probably, but the reason we were able when we had the flood last summer, the reason we were able to kind of go to the water treatment plant in the middle of the night and do that was we'd plan for that. And we knew that that's where we were going to go. And we had done it before, not within a few years, but we'd done it and we knew it worked. And so we it was like, okay, that's what, that's what we're doing. Um, so yes, obviously, and, um, and every time you have some emergency or near emergency, we tend to practice them more often. Um, right. but, uh, yeah, so, so this particular plan, you have your, it needs council approval, but it's really the state's plan. It's not ours. Yep. I appreciate it. And. So just wanted to add also, so, uh, the 
Commission on Recovery and Resilience is also, you know, this was something that had come out loud and clear from the community forums that there was interest in, I think, learning more about the plan, having feedback, also looking at are there resources for the community? So is there like a checklist for local businesses or homeowners, that kind of thing that is beyond what this type of plan does? And so that group is... Um, has already um, been putting out for proposals from some consultants. Um, there's a forum tomorrow evening, 6.30 to 8.30 at the Senior Center for people who want to learn more, engage, provide feedback. Um, but we are pursuing through the commission in partnership with the city, a more like a broader plan that does more than just what this does. So it will supplement and complement um, this as well. And that's a great opportunity for feedback on, you know, what, what might benefit community members. So we're we're right. doing that as well. And, and I've talked to them also about it and and, I, and I'm going to contribute to that. And what they're looking to do, they're putting together an operations plan, an emergency operations plan of this is what you, when the power goes out, this is what you do. When, when there's an ice storm, this one is a flood. That's, that's what they want. And, and that's what we do too. And that's something we're lacking. We know that. And we want that also. Yeah. But it's different from this. This is that, in a, it's, this is a management plan. It's, yeah, where that is going to be an operations plan. That... All right. Is there a motion to approve the emergency operation or emergency management plan? I move to adopt the emergency the uh, emergency management plan. Is there a second? Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, thanks, Steve. And Mayor, your signature goes on that. As of last year, I just type it in. You don't mm -hmm. actually have to sign it anymore. I just, I just okay. type in your name. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Next up, we have the uh, item to set our water and sewer rates. I think Sarah is coming up with. Basically, um, while she's coming up, I'd say, you know, we, this is simply, this is exactly what we had projected back at budget time. And when we reviewed the budgets with you and you adopted the budget, so there's no change in any of that, but if you can. And so this year I see it's 4.2% across the board because that's inflation plus 1%. Sarah. Are there questions? I hadn't planned to present because this is just um, math based on the amounts that you were previously presented. But if there are questions about them, I'm happy to give it a shot. I think my question is really about the process that we're using in, in terms of, is this really budgeting if we're just saying CPI plus one every year? And maybe that works for a while, but wouldn't it be more appropriate to revert to old fashioned budgeting and do a line by line budget to look at what our program really needs to operate versus an arbitrary percentage? Uh -huh. So th there's nothing in this budget that is fluffy, right? There are operational costs and personnel costs that, you know, we are pretty beholden to, and there are a lot of wiggle room there. Where the CPI plus one helps is for inflationary in increases, and then the plus one helps fund capital. And so if we were to, I mean, we could put more in this for capital, which would drive that rate up higher and make that increase bigger. But right now we're trying to work within those confines based on um, past council policy. And so uh, we could always put more, but to put less would be a reduction in water line repairs and that kind of item. We don't have a lot of stuff to skim from personnel and operating costs. I understand. But to answer that question, um, you know, the, this proposal this year is based on the budget that you all saw and passed in February, I think. Um, but the, the And you've adopted the long-term water improvement plan, which calls for the plus one. But you could, in theory, reduce the budget and have, like, say, no increase other than plus one. Like, you could, whatever budget you have, then put plus one in for the for the capital. So, so that is correct. It, the budget would depend. So if another year we want to take a deeper dive into the water and sewer budgets, we could do that. Absolutely. Looking at the rates of increase, because we had some high inflation rate years, um, it seems like it's appropriate to do that. So for really, that was my concern was future budgeting for how we do it. Obviously this is on track and we've discussed it, but my, my hope for this next budget season is to have water and sewer 
and district teak all ready to go at the time we do general funds so we can do deep dives then um you know i know that isn't what will go on the ballot but i do think it makes a difference to see the whole picture at once i just with the flood this year i was i couldn't sure <laughs> so sarah it, the the fixed cost of water and sewer is essentially o overhead and and the rate is usage is that how how the budget breaks down into in big pieces? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, the different rates combined get us to the total um, metered revenue and and other fixed costs. That it's a it's a makeup. Some of it's based on usage. Some of it is just based on fixed costs. But it's not a direct tie to one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, part of doing the water sewer rate study will help evaluate that and help us change how we set our rates so that they pick up those items more clearly. Yeah, I mean that's the mystery for me is how we so, how we come up with those rates. Initially, so again, that split was set by the council had a rate committee, and that was their proposal. And it was set, and I think essentially it, it was supposed to match. I mean, you said fixed costs, right? The the bond cost basically um, to make sure we always had enough to cover at least our our bonds. Um, and it's really it's the readiness to serve charge. Um, you know, people from our generation remember when we paid a basic phone bill just to get a dial tone and then long distance calls, you know, for the actual calls. I do remember. Right. So that's what this is kind of the same idea where, you know, it was like you you have a cost just to have water at your tap and functioning sewer. And then your use rate then depends after that. But it should be looked at, and we were scheduled to do it. We just have had, you know, it's lower on the priority list. I was surprised to see that we're uh, there are some. We saw flat rate customers. I I thought my recollection was that it was about twenty five years ago that everybody had to go to meters. Is that was I wrong about that? I believe it's very few, but I don't have that historical knowledge per se. So I'm sorry. That's correct. There were a couple of hardship cases. Either it was difficult to install their meters or wouldn't grant us permission to go on their property, a couple of things like that. But it's very, it's it's not, it's only a two or three. And we could go back and get you the specifics on that. <laughs> Are we set? Any other questions? Uh, and Tim, do you want to? I guess I'd like to make a motion that for the next fiscal budget for the water and sewer that we pursue a more conventional line by line budget process and do not adopt the CPI plus one as as our guide. Hmm? So you're you're not saying so that we're looking at a couple of motions. One is this and then eventually whatever happens with this, I think we'll have a motion to approve, approve for this year. I'll second Tim's motion. Okay, do we have discussion about that? Lauren. I guess two questions. One, I would be curious from, and I don't know if it's the folks here or if Kurt's on or something like has, has this approach been effective at meeting the needs or does it bear re-looking at? But the other thing on my mind is we have had the conversation for a couple of years and I don't know the status of the stormwater utility, but it seems like that would also influence because potentially, because if that's more money going into this fund. or this would, That would be a separate fund. A that. separate fund, but would some, some of, of the projects be yeah, projects that right now are funded through this? So I think it would have implications. So I'm wondering if the timing of that might be like the fall and we could be looking at both of those together, but I don't know what. Realistically, we will not have a stormwater utility by the time we're doing the budgets this winter. So we will be looking okay. at this budget. I think the question, and I think I appreciate Tim's concerns and it's all good, is it, I guess maybe I'm questioning, not questioning the motion, questioning your intent. Would this be for, like, are we doing the water and sewer differently or would the proposal be do all the entire city budget line by line? You know, are we just treating this differently or how how's that going? Are we, that's all. You, know, you talk about how we're going to do this one budget next year, but how does that fit with the rest of it? Well, I, I don't know. I don't, I mean, we don't go. So I guess you're, I'm referring to the way we've been budgeting. Okay, that's what, that's all I just what I meant. That, that's, 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 I appreciate that. Okay. That's, 
I was I thought you meant something different. But... Yeah, now I I can imagine what you were thinking. <laughs> no. Okay. Thank you. And Tim, you you envision doing this at the same time we do the general fund budget. Yes. Yeah. I'd like that. Um, what what I'm thinking about it might be the way you phrased it, Tim, <laughs> is that uh, the way I think the motion is phrased, uh, a, a an affirmative vote on the motion would be a vote tonight to not do CPI plus one percent in the future, and uh, with without looking at the uh, at how we do it. Uh, at, at the results of the process we go through next year, I wonder if that's really where what we want to be committing ourselves to, or because it would could be that uh, we go through the whole process uh, at budget time next year, and we find out that a sensible approach for the budget winds up to be just the same as what we would raise by doing CPI plus one. And in that case, is it worth doing the work every year to? The council certainly could revert to CPI plus one. So. How long have we been doing it this way? The plus one has been compounding. So every year it's 2% and 3%. I, I am guessing. I feel like we're at seven or eight percent that is allotted for capital that we are ensuring is allotted for capital. So it does allow DPW to do a lot more and and spread those dollars further as far as the waterline projects are concerned. And, and I think, right, again, the times have changed. I mean, you're right, Tim, we had we've had high inflation at the time. Inflation was, you know, a couple of percent each year. And I think the council's like, all right, you know, we've got costs, we've got equipment costs, we've got pay payroll costs, those kind of things. So if we assume the budget's going to go up by cost of living, let's add an extra percent to it for to hit our capital goals. And I think that was the real crux of the policy was whatever we change the budget by, we're going to add a percent to it specifically for capital. So uh, and we budgeted since then just the same way we did with the general fund budget, unless we get specific guidance from the council in advance, we've said, all right, that's going to be our starting point. And then you all did actually review the budget in February. You did get the line budget for this in February, approved that budget, and this is based on that. So, but if, if, if I think if, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think what you're saying is we wouldn't necessarily assume that was going to be the outcome. It would be, that might be the outcome as the mayor said, but it wouldn't be, it's that no matter what. It's appropriate rather than having another council sit here and say some council in the deep air distant past said this is the way we're doing it. The council have the ability to look at it and say, okay, yeah, let, that, that worked. Let's go council back to it. Certainly change that policy. And I, and I really do think that the, the big council policy, which you actually continue to endorse with the water plan, is, is the additional capital money. Yeah, next year. Mm -hmm. that. Favorite. So I don't know for sure the answer to your question about how long we've been doing it this way, but if you, if you look at the table, uh, from 2015 to 2019, it's all flat percentage <clears throat> numbers, which suggests that it wasn't CPI plus a factor. It's it was just a number we picked. That sounds. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I, I wouldn't want to jeopardize the cap the capital investment part certainly, and I assume that that one percent is taken out and. Put in the capital budget, and then what happens if there's a surplus in the in the balance? I, there hasn't been. There hasn't been. Yeah, we have plenty of lines to fix. So it's you know. No, no, no. I don't mean in the line fixing side. I'm. Oh, in the operating side. On the operating side. Yeah, I mean there there really hasn't historically been, and anything that rolls over from year to year goes down into fund balance, which would then you know we use that for waterline repairs, so, but there typically aren't big surpluses in these funds. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it seems like it might be after six or seven or eight years, it might be worth reviewing and it, it may end up that it, it actually works pretty well, but worth, I think, maybe digging through it to 
ensure that that's the case. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, you know, looking at it and seeing does this policy still make sense for next time, it seems great. I, I'm not presupposing that it's a bad policy at this point, but it makes total sense to review it, see what it, see what's giving us. Is it too little or too much or hitting it on the head? So it seems, I don't know if the timing, I mean, just thinking of the budget process, it's so overwhelming. I don't know if there's a way to do this like earlier or does it, I know it's hard if we don't do it by the time we've done the budget. So it's like either earlier or during our, our choices, if we want to potentially change it so that we can be giving the staff all the guidance they need to do the budgeting. But it's just hard to imagine finding more, <laughs> more things to be going through during budget season, but that's worth it. <laughs> we'll ask our staff to figure out how to make that work. But I think we should be clear from our council retreating conversations that the process as it's been exactly doesn't have to happen just that way every year. And if there are ways to simplify it and make it flow better, um, I think we were all hoping for that. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, and and I think that one of the outcomes was that sort of September, October, we would ho have that conversation and try to wrap up all these ideas and policies and say, how do you want to proceed with all of this and get some clarity. And then we know all of us know going ahead how we're going to be approaching it and we'll have some ideas and you'll have some ideas and so that is definitely on our calendar to do okay ready to, ready to vote on tim's motion if so all those in favor signify by saying aye, aye. aye. any opposed all right and you're clear enough on what the motion is john okay and you need a motion yes. yes. Now we have to have a motion to approve the uh, rates for this year. Is there a motion to do that? I'll move that we approve the uh, water and sewer rates for this up for this year. Is there second. a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion about that? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thanks, Sarah. All right. Next, we have item seven, Parklet Fee Ordinance Amendment, first reading. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we discussed this at the last meeting. You all gave me the head nod. Um, as we mentioned, we have three parklets, so currently only two in town um, that normally pay a fee of uh, $8 a day uh, for a business day. That's what it costs to park fully. So it comes out to 2,304 per parklet for the if you're there from April 15 to October 31. And given that some people are still dealing with the flood, we talked about the idea of maybe waiving the fee this year for their hardship. And you all said, yes, that sounded good. Um, as I thought about drafting an ordinance, I thought rather than having to do this every time, why don't we just put a waiver provision in? And then after you pass the ordinance, so you can just pass the waiver for the season and then any other time we feel like doing it. So that's it. So that was the only change to the current ordinance was one sentence saying the city council uh, can waive pending on circumstances or ex uh, extenuating circumstances. We have to open a public hearing. You do, but I okay. want to explain. This. Thank you. Public hearing is now open. Is there any member of the public who'd like to comment? Or any member of the council who has any thoughts about this? All right, I'll well, close the public hearing. And we do not have to have two. Well, you do. Second okay. meeting would be the next meeting. Okay. So is there a motion to uh, schedule a second reading on this as uh, drafted? So moved. And is there a second? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Fastest ordinance hearing I can ever remember. All right, item eight, FEMA. FEMA buildings, the whole team. Yep.
Good evening, everyone. I'm going to tee things up for Stevens and Associates. They're going to be giving a presentation um, on our final report for conceptual design. Um, but I wanted to go over a few things first, just to kind of you know talk about what we're looking for from you um, as potential action items um, following the presentation. Um, so we have discussed this report briefly with FEMA, well, with the Consultants Guidehouse, to take a look at you know, uh, what the options are moving forward. And so really before you today um, is a final report that we're looking for you to accept so that we can get it to FEMA so that then we can start the process of evaluating what's next. Um, we have learned that um, in order to take some next steps, we really need to get firmer numbers in terms of evaluating which options we'll select. Um, and so those will also be future decision items. Um, and so really what that means is we're gonna be looking at uh, the city hall options, um, 1B and 2B, and also the fire station. Um, so depending on what those reimbursement numbers look like, um, we'll be coming back to you for decision items, but this report is reflective of those decision items. Um, additionally, I do wanna note that we are going to be working with Stevens and Associates to do a contract amendment so that we can do um, some design work. And so that that will be a little bit more of an intensive process. I had hoped to have that for you tonight. We're not quite ready yet to execute that contract, but in getting this report in front of FEMA, we'll be able to at least cross the threshold of starting the conversation. Um, the details are outlined in the memo that was provided in the cover. Um, the other thing I do want to note um, is that um, we have a memo that was posted today from the planning department about codes and standards. And so really, you know, what has shifted a little bit here is we've received guidance that um, we need to bring the buildings up to codes and standards, and that will be our baseline. Whereas initially when we started this, we were looking at just putting everything back in kind, um, but we actually need to bring things up to codes and standards, which will be a little bit more intensive in terms of doing that work. And so um, that's also outlined in this report. I don't want to steal their thunder because they're going to get into all the details here for you. Um, but... The long and short of it is we have a couple of steps. We need to accept this report. We'll work on the contract amendment and then we'll um, issue a, an official letter from planning, which will be reflective of the um, memo items that are detailed from planning. And so that's what I have for an introduction. Um, so I'm gonna have Steams and Associates take it away from here. Um, and that's what I'm gonna say, thanks. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kelly. And she stole a little bit of my thunder. But uh, so uh, we're with Stevens and Associates. I'm Corey Frizzi. I'm a principal and a civil engineer. And with me is Mark Herb Kurzman, our director of architecture. Bob Stevens, the president, is on vacation, unable to join us. Um, I wanted to start by thanking the committee again, thanking Bill and Kelly and the and the whole team. Uh, Sarah in the last several weeks has facilitated conversations with FEMA, which we will get into have been extremely important and valuable. Um, so as Kelly said, uh, we are wanting to present to you as briefly as possible. We don't wanna to repeat too much of what we went over last month, but there have been some changes we wanna highlight. And then there are some decisions or feedback that we're looking for or from the city um, in conjunction with the committee um, about how we address minimum codes and standards, which as Kelly said, is now our baseline for FEMA funding and the preferred alternative. What is the city's preferred alternative if FEMA will fund above the minimum codes and, and standards? So I'll try and briefly get through these slides. Um, I'm gonna probably skip a few because they're kind of placeholders for reference if we need to use them um, so that Mark can get into focusing on the alternatives that we're recommending. So there's our project purpose again, which was to work with the city, explore alternatives, and ultimately get to uh, a resilient solution that FEMA will fund, will, first of all, meets FEMA's requirements, and then that FEMA will fund um, this is an overview of the process we went through. We talked about this last month. Um, we have evaluated several alternatives 
And so through an analysis, I feel like there's kind of three categories of the analysis we did. First was to repair in kind. Um, we need to maintain that as a baseline for FEMA, but that is not what we're talking about as far as their baseline for funding. That's more of a reference point. I'll explain that in a minute. And then we did alternatives. Uh, we looked at dry flood proofing options for the three city buildings, the city hall, the fire station, the police station. And then we also looked at how can we do it better? And out of that, quite honestly, came dozens of alternatives because you have all different nuances of, of many different alternatives that, that we worked on. So this, this slide is intended to highlight some of the new information that we've identified through talking with the committee and with FEMA. Um, there's the first bucket, repairs in kind. So still needed as a reference point, um, but that is no longer the baseline. Uh, FEMA has explained to us in the last month, number two, minimum codes and standards. So what we understand that to mean is that FEMA will fund not just to repair the buildings that were damaged, but also to bring them up to current codes. And that is local building code, international building code, the state of Vermont implements the International Building Code um, and local ordinance and standards. So we're in communication with the planning department. Kelly referenced uh, a memo that we're expecting. I haven't seen it yet, but that's going to highlight pieces of the local ordinance, which also need to be adhered to as we repair these buildings. And we understand that FEMA will pay for that funding. So the best example I can give you, and, and Mark will get into the, the differences, but raising utilities, okay? So trying to get all the utilities out of city hall basement um, or any of the basements. And we also are talking about least cost, okay? So we we're, we're have to identify for FEMA what the least cost is to do these alternatives. And then they have been communicating with us from the start that there is an opportunity for them to fund more than that. Um, I've highlighted the title here. It's a 428 combined campus project with their in discussion with us and the committee about. Um, and we now need to do more work. They want more accurate cost data to compare the minimum codes and standards to the city's preferred alternative. So we're going to need to know from the city what what preferred alternative to proceed with and to get more accurate pricing for. And then FEMA will do um, an analysis um, to determine whether they will fund that difference in project cost. This is a very similar table to the table we presented last time. It has the different alternatives that we explored and got cost estimates for. We've reorganized it and we've highlighted it. Um, Mark's gonna jump in here and go through the differences of some of the alternatives. I wanna cue him up by saying that we wanna get in, we wanna support you in a decision about the city hall basement. Um, there is a recommendation by us to fill the city hall basement. And last month we talked about moving the risk as close to zero as we can. And so one of the things that we're gonna focus in on tonight is an alternative before you to flood proof the city hall basement without filling it and our concerns around that and the alternative to fill the basement, okay? Um, and then Kelly referenced the other decision which is your preferred alternative. And we have a recommended alternative we will walk you through, which includes a new fire station. I think I'm turning it over to you and you can help do the slides for it if you'd like. Yeah, talk about steel thumber. I think we're done. <laughs> no, I was just kidding. Um, so, um, so this next slide just wants to highlight um, uh, this point, what we call City Hall Option 1B, which is the concept to uh, to dry flood proof the basement of the existing city hall and to uh, to keep it as such to keep it as a functional space. Now, this may be a valid alternative. Um, 
However, in, in our initial analysis and whatnot costing, we do believe in order to, well, let me say it this way. The way that we first presented this, we were not looking at it as it becoming a matter of meeting codes and standards per se, at least to the way it's being defined by FEMA. So that being said, we would kind of elevate this level of quality or not quality, but uh, completeness of this in order to try to uh, to make this as, as uh, you know, uh, let's say, you know, waterproofed as possible or flood proofed as possible. Now, while we think that it's possible to achieve something here that will be usable, we do not believe from experience or uh, empirical knowledge that um, it's going to take the risk of flooding damage to this level to zero. Um, and so it will be expensive. There'll be a lot of things to do. And and really, while it may initially work for a while, we don't know what's going to happen over time with the way the, the space is. This would be a city management issue, the way the space is controlled. Holes can be drilled into the walls. Things can happen. Uh, and and if there is a flood event, you know, there's going to be some water in here and it's going to have to be re, uh, renovated again. So um, can I add something? Please do. Um, so we've. we've internally talking in the office and wrestling with this decision um, where we've landed is that you could flood proof this basement the amount of money that would take for us to feel comfortable with saying that this basement is flood proofed pivots us to the recommendation that put that money somewhere else move your risk closer to zero by filling it um, and and you'll see in a second, you know where where we think we should spend that money instead. Thank you. Again, it is the management of of money versus risk versus uh, function functional success. So um, it's on the table as something that you can consider. Um, with regard to the next highlight here, we refer to a category. Now we've repackaged this a little bit as minimum codes and standards, um, which is. Again, we've learned uh, from FEMA is the prefer their preferred uh, baseline, and so in this regard, we're we're combining. Um, uh, by the way, we failed to say or remind you that uh, um, I'll just say there's an overview. Uh, the police station is is included in all these alternatives uh, for the renovations that it is. PS one is a relatively small amount of work to flood proof and and clean up because of the limited damage. So just, if you will, follow that PS1 goes through all of these. Okay, it's part of all of them. Um, uh, so as we look at uh, this minimum codes and standards option, it jumps to the uh, alternative we had created, which is called CH2B in tandem with FS1, which is the fire station. We'll get into that. So uh, CH2B is an idea where the basement of the... Um, of the uh, city hall is actually uh, abandoned as a use. It's filled with concrete. It basically becomes a crawl space. Uh, and in order to relocate, reposition um, the functions that were there, in this instance, we're proposing that there is a, uh, we had previously said two story, now we're saying a three story addition to the city hall, which is to the far right of this diagram. Uh, the, base, the basement level would be not excavated, uh, so that would be just fill and the kind of yellowish colors you see in the perimeter represent what's happening on the grade level, which is an entrance uh, lift elevator that gets you from grade uh, on the on the south side up to the first level. There's an exit stair there. Uh, the vertical line to the right is actually kind of retaining wall, just holding back on excavated areas. And the top there is a. Uh, uh, there's a little access to possibly keeping part of the basement for utility purposes. I don't want to get into the confusion of that. It's something we talked about early. We don't think that that should happen, but it's on here. And then there are two public restrooms which have accessibility directly to the outside on the north part of the building. Uh, that was something programmatically understood from the, the committee that was designed for the city. So that happens in this diagram. The addition itself is about 30 feet by about 70 feet per floor. And next slide, please. Uh, this is the main floor that, uh, again, sorry, these tones don't show well on the screen, but uh, your individual copies might show it better. It shows the lift coming from grade to this level where there's a quarter that brings you into the main floor of the city hall. Uh, it also suggests that the existing elevator shaft would get reconfigured, and so you would have access to the elevator from this side of uh, the building, if you were, will, and there's a, you'd be able to pick up a little space uh, in the administrative area there on the other side of the elevator um, and uh, and to the north part of this site, this lighter shaded area. That represents the relocated 
uh, mechanical area for all the equipment that's currently in the basement or, or some of it at least it would be the electrical panels it would be uh, the uh, the major uh, 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 electrical systems and communication systems and other things the mechanical system uh, would be located here as well as possibly some things on the roof depending on how it's resolved and then the uh, the next floor is what we call the second floor this is essentially the same level as the the theater um, again, it has an exit stair. This uh, it abandons the existing uh, emergency um, fire escapes that are on the back of the building and creates a corridor that runs along the back of the building that lets people exit from both sides of that building back to the same stair down to the basement. There's a third floor as well. I don't have the plan, but it's similar. <laughs> and there's much detail to be worked out. This is a concept diagram at best. This is a cross section that shows the relationships. It shows the uh, basement kind of shaded in gray and becomes a crawl space, you see. So instead of being nine and a half feet deep, it's actually about three and a half feet deep. Um, and then you see the cross section. Uh, these are just diagrams to show uh, some of the vertical relationships. Um, in addition to the work on the city hall, this calls for uh, alternate S FS1, which is the fire station, which brings the fire station continuing to operate as a fire station, but up to code. So there are things that have to happen in the building that are described in the written notes there. But one of the things we would do, we would recommend abandoning the exterior uh, ramp that goes from the grade down into the lower level and instead installing a new elevator that would service all levels of building. It would be both a freight elevator and a passenger elevator. So it would be two-sided. You would come in and out of from either side. There would be some reconfiguration in the inside of the the fire station, which we have not kind of worked out yet, but that would happen. And then the next drawing kind of shows you where that happens vertically. So you could see uh, from the grade side about where that arrow is, you would be able to come in from the outside and use it for freight access. It could go down into the basement and back. And on from the other side, uh, kind of the uh, apparatus room side, we would create an area where it's easy for people to come in and out and go vertically to the second floor. So that's these concept diagrams. Again, we are seeing those two these uh, these this collection of improvements as a matter of the minimum codes and standards, uh, including um, a police station one plan uh, that would probably be the baseline regarding FEMA. Okay, the next area we're going to focus is uh, what we're we're recommending as a preferred or we're recommending as an alternative that you can decide later if it is the preferred alternative or not. And that is, uh, it takes uh, concept C2H, uh, CH2A, which is, uh, um, here we're filling the basement. I'll go to that slide again, just to reiterate, um, this recommended alternative includes PS1 for the police station. Yes. And it includes FS1, which we just discussed about flood proof in the fire station. That's correct. In this instance, though, um, in this instance, as opposed to creating an addition to City Hall for additional space, what happens is we are uh, proposing that there would be a new fire station, which we discussed. It includes the FS2 alternative as well. And this is the preferred alternative where basically the, the challenge, as you may know, is the fire station, even if it gets waterproof or uh, flood proof, is still likely to take on water. The flood line in the fire station is about five feet above the current apparatus floor. It's hard to get away from that not flooding in another event uh, and, and really uh, compromising the operation of that facility. So our kind of stretch recommendation is to, and this may work into the FEMA numbers, is to build a new fire station at the location we discussed that shows up later in these diagrams. And uh, uh, and then re you have an opportunity to repurpose the fire station uh, by raising the floor at the grade level and, and reusing that space as uh, city functions that are being displaced for losing the lower level of the basement. So uh, I'll just say this, it could be, you know, the main space on the main floor could be, it'll have a generous ceiling. It could become a council chamber that replaces this room, or it could be a meeting room of some sort. It could be offices. And then there's the entire second floor that could be adapted as functional offices. And with the new elevator installed there, everything would be accessible and usable. And presumably we'd be working uh, uh, it'd still be flood proof, so we'd we'd be controlling uh, flood damage or uh, damage due to floods if it if it did indeed flood. But we would have a different use in that building, and a new fire station would be uh, constructed. We lost our connection here. I feel like I'm jinxed. The internet went out last month. <laughs> what did I do? Oh, back here we're back. I'm sorry, did I do something? No, no. You're okay. okay. All right. So uh, advance the slide, please, Corey. Okay. Well, just mentioned this doesn't have the addition. 
right? I did say so, that. This does not have the addition. This reuses the fire station. So with regard to the concept for the new fire station, you've seen these plan diagrams before. We'll show you this. This shows uh, City Hall clearly, the existing fire station clearly, and the existing police station all in concert there in the plan. And where the kind of more reddish, uh, orangish dot is, uh, or box is, is the place where we could see potentially a new fire station. You guys have talked about this before. So this, uh, uh, and then uh, this was the kind of cross-sectional diagram showing that with the grade, we think that the uh, vehicles will still be uh, able to manipulate. Of course, more study has to happen, but this is part of the recommended alternative. And then in summary here, so we wanted to highlight some of the numbers for this. Uh, I don't know if you can scroll up on this a little or not, but uh, um, maybe you can't. That's all right. Uh, yeah. At any rate, so, uh, so if we, thank you. So if we add up all these numbers where that are highlighted here, um, we're talking about PS1, uh, which is restoring the police station uh, kind of in kind and waterproofing it or flood proofing it rather, I'm sorry. And then we jump down to the minimum, minimum codes and standards part. In this instance, since we'd be filling the basement, we'd be looking at uh, CH2A, which is down at the bottom as opposed to CH2B here, but we would be uh, uh, restoring the fire station and dry flood proofing it uh, there's that cost highlighted. And then the entire category there, the recommended alternatives, um, which includes PS1 and FS1 repurposed, uh, and it has a cost for that at the bottom line. And so when we add that all up, based upon the information we have at this time, we're looking at $16,300,000 as the cost estimate at, based upon information we have at this time. For comparison, the um, minimum codes and standards alternative, I believe, totaled 17 and a half million. I'm sorry, seven and a half million. Thank you, Bill. Sorry, seven and a half million. Um, so then we go one more okay. slide. Yep. So this this last slide, uh, is it on there? I think I have to click again and then I can go. Down. Okay, there you go. Perfect. Uh, so this last slide uh, is really a conversation piece to go into the rest of the meeting and uh, this kind of represents a kind of a decision flow diagram of what we believe has to happen in short term and then what may happen in the long term. Uh, horizontally, the timeline goes from now on the left to let's say six months from now, at which time we would hope to have uh, the proposed additional information that FEMA is requesting uh, for you to make a decision. Uh, so on the top is the minimum codes and standards flow, um, which has the project we discussed, the alternatives included in the kind of orangish brownish box. And at the bottom is the recommended alternatives, which has some of the same pieces, but some other things as well. You can see the timelines running vertical. There's now, at which point we think that the city needs to, or the city council needs to recommend uh, or make a decision about which direction that they'd like, or which option they'd like to pursue in the city hall, whether it's 1B or 2B. Um, and that will affect the flow of how we move forward um, and then in about three or four months, uh, we would have developed both of these uh, tracks, the recommended alternative and the minimum codes alternative. Um, and we would get a preliminary price uh, check from our consultants on what that would be. Uh, and based upon that, we would continue on. Um, uh, and there would, uh, for another six months, and we would get updated, or I'm sorry, another three months, which... Uh, matches up the 18 month uh, mark since the flood event, which is a critical date relative to the FEMA uh, funding um, route or uh, process. Uh, and at that time, the city council would have information to know about uh, what FEMA is willing to fund and what gap there is, uh, the cost delta there, and uh, a final direction could be determined to finish the process. If I could just add, um, we didn't mention the DPW space tonight. Um, we are still aware of that in communication with the committee about that. And we understand that um, there's, well, we have talked with FEMA and, and, and Sarah about that being temporary space for now. Um, and it potentially could turn into permanent space. Um, so that's going to get wrapped into this work. Um, as I said at the beginning of the meeting, there are, nuances and you know other ideas that come out of these alternatives so we're trying to be brief tonight we can have a discussion come back to some of that detail if you want but i did want to mention that the, the dpw space 
still appears viable and something that we're pursuing. Thank you. Yeah. And for the people less familiar with our facilities, I think what they're referring to is that the DPW administrative offices, files, cabinets, project engineering was all located in the basement of City Hall and have since, because after the flood, and they've, been, they've relocated to the DPW garage and are fully functioning there, but in what you would consider temporary space. So one of the things that we're pursuing is whether the, the renovation of that into more permanent space could be covered because it, they're there because of the flood, so. Well, thanks. I've got, I've got some questions. I'm sure other people have questions too. Um, if if we were to go with the, and I didn't see it in the in the diagrams, but it's a little hard to read that stuff. If we decided to go with the uh, new fire department uh, building, when and then not do the addition to the city hall is there uh is there still a place to build in the uh public bathrooms uh and where would that go that's a excuse me that's a very good question uh i'm very confident we can work that out we didn't actually we didn't figure that detail out but i'm very confident we can find a place to do that okay i would think that um instead of building the addition we'd be building a new fire station on the same property and so that we would be able to wrap that sort of uh, programming into that new building yeah, maybe. rather than just putting a small addition off the of city hall. I also think it could go into the existing fire station building as well, because there'll be probably some ample space and easy access from grade on that uh, addition that was done 20 years ago. And if we, if we did the, um, if we did the new fire station and we then converted the existing building to office space, would it be a similar approach of uh filling in the basement the way you're, you're proposing for city hall yes yes that is part of the recommendation uh, mm -hmm. uh the truth is and it doesn't really reflect this here it may make sense to fill in the basement of the fire station in that instance too the existing fire station just because it would eliminate a lot of risk and potential yep. damage the, the the valuable space of that building going forward would be the upper two floors clearly mm -hmm. Okay, so. Uh, th uh, thank you for that presentation, although uh, it's confusing. I mean, yeah. um, by chance, uh, we had an energy committee uh, meeting last night. I, I represent the council on the meeting, and um, we were talking about uh, the council resolution for net zero by 2030. We were thinking about uh, the new energy code, which becomes effective July 1st of this year, uh, which ha I, I think th I think the municipal buildings are subject to the commercial building energy standard, um, which has a lot of changes having to do with, uh, you know, air tightness and that sort of thing. But also, um, for example, it requires you to provide space for uh, battery storage. And we got to thinking about the diesel generators that are in the basement and what it would cost to elevate them and why not. If we, if the resolution, the council resolution is considered the way an or a city, a local ordinance is considered, then we ought to take it into consideration. And um, it was the committee's recommendation that we at least explore the idea of replacing those fossil fuel um, boilers with uh, energy store uh, electric storage batteries or a similar system. Well, thank you for saying that. I'll I'll just say in house very early in conversations that we had that included Bob Stevens that we were talking about that and we didn't want to go yeah, too much over the wall. Think. <laughs> uh, but those are definitely forward-looking ideas that a lot of not just jurisdictions, but you know, private institutions are going to. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, even so, though those, yeah, even though those boilers aren't used very often, it, you know, there's a even if we were just reimbursed for the cost of elevating and it had to had to front the rest, it would be nice to know what that would uh, what that cost would be. I would say that it's an important alternative to look at, and and you so you could evaluate it based upon the information we come up with. So. Uh, is it is it legitimate to consider that a council resolution would be considered like a local ordinance and that the, the net zero goal of the city 
uh, would be accepted by FEMA as a legitimate uh, standard? I think so. I think we need to confirm it with FEMA. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And I, I, you said July 1st, and I'm trying to think through the timing of negotiating with FEMA, but um, certainly something that we will make note of and look into. And and just to build off of what Mark said, we actually had a conversation. Uh, we're working with Engineering Services of Vermont. They're the mechanical and electrical engineer on this project. I don't think that the energy efficiency would be eligible for reimbursement just because it's not a coder standard that would be recognized. We can certainly check with FEMA, but um, getting sort of a friend here in the background letting me know that it's not the case. Improved project is what we're being told. And to that to that line, um, predating many of you on the council, but not all of you, the part of that council policy is actually any new municipal buildings would be 100% also fuel free uh, existing buildings if we have to upgrade, but that anything new that we built. So again, it's a pol council policy, not a ordinance uh, or a thing, but it, so presumably that would apply to a new fire station, uh, not renovating an existing building. So, uh, and again, it's council policy could change, but I'm just throwing that in. I hadn't brought it up before because it was only recently we started talking about a new building. So I guess I misunderstood. I, well, the, the, I don't think anyone told think, you that before. I, I think, I think it, if the building code is changed at the state of Vermont level, that that would be considered a, a minimum code. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So there's still the, there, that may help the cause, yeah, right? right? With the, the building code piece, um, separate from the council policy. Um, to finish what I was saying, the, uh, so our mechanical and electrical engineer did look at um, the ability for batteries to replace those boilers. Um, and it didn't make it into the details of our report, but it's something that we could, it, it will be provided as an appendix um, and and something we will definitely look into further. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty, you got a good base. Any other questions? Lauren. Could you just describe again? Um, so it sounds like there was some change to the understanding of what the baseline, but is what we're pre being presented, like my understanding coming out of the last meeting was that we're looking for like full FEMA reimbursement ideally, and we're trying to come up with a project and that's still the path we're on. So even though there's been this change of the baseline that of how we need to assess that, it's not changing what we're eligible for. It's just a different um, baseline than what we had believed before. Right. So that's right. why it's changing. That's Is right. that accurate? I, yeah. So I'll refer to this slide. Um, up top is the minimum codes and standards. And last month, for all intents and purposes, we were talking about repair in kind. And so repair in kind would have just been return to what you guys had pre-flood. And what we, th we, we understand that FEMA is actually changing their policy and so we're we're changing with them and now fema will fund not just repair in kind but also adding an elevator making sure everything's ada accessible as part of the work to restore the building so yes we understand that fema will fully fund the minimum codes and standards okay we were also charged through the RFP with looking at what else could we do? How could we make it even better? And what we've been told by FEMA for, for months now, as we've had these conversations is, yes, there's the opportunity to fund something above the baseline, especially if it removes additional risk. And they use the term repeat offenders. So, you know, a fire station that's been flooded three times in the last 30 years and is a critical facility to the city, let's look at moving that fire station outside of the floodplain. And that's what creates the two paths that we're going to pursue to what we're calling basically 50% of design. And that will give us accurate enough cost information for FEMA to do cost benefit analysis. And then they will be able to tell the city what they are going to fund. But at the premise of it, they will fully fund returning the buildings 
with minimum codes and standards met. Is that helpful? Okay. It's confusing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for Okay. That, that's helpful to just hear it described again. Yeah. Um, just one other question. So if we're having to come back with a specific proposal, like one question that had come up last month was, you know, are there other possible sites for the fire station, for instance, if we're building a new one, is that going to be part of the analysis? Like, do we lock, how locked in do we get before we start to get a real sense from FEMA, what's going to be fundable? Good, good. that we could do sort of the general review, um, but we could potentially look at an alternative location. We just wanted to make sure that we had a placeholder for a place that we could put it on city land that we own. I will add from a design perspective, um, we, we call different phases of design, schematic design, design development, construction documents. You know, we're gonna go a little farther than schematic design, but generally speaking, we think that most of a schematic design for a new fire station could be applied to a different site. Okay, so we're going to go down the road with FEMA to try and establish the funding so that you can make a decision about whether you pursue a new fire station. A lot of that work could be used if at that point you decide to go to a different site. Okay. Yeah, you uh, you mentioned the um, 428 combined campus. Is Is that what makes the fire station eligible? The, the idea of a combined campus, the, the proximity, the clustering of the buildings, or I'm just, with respect to the question that Lauren had. We don't have a, I don't have an answer for that. I don't think Corey does though, but I believe it's related when we had the one phone meeting with FEMA. I think that that was part like of Sarah it. May have yes, an answer. Sarah knows, yeah. Sarah, she talks to them more than we do. <laughs> Every week at 10.30. Uh, yeah, so I meet with um, the state's consultants who are our go-between between between the state and FEMA uh, Mondays every week. And so really what this is doing is we would be have to by 18 months determine that this would be considered a complex project and it would encompass these three buildings as opposed to just each building individually. And so what that would do is um, I'm working next week to try to come up with a game plan because we don't want to put this in front of FEMA until we are ready because it has been um, very difficult and we want them to see the correct baseline and not have to um, go back and forth about what that is. And so um, myself and Kelly and at some point, hopefully um, Mayor McCullough and Bill likely too will need to um, have a sit down with representatives from VEM and the state and their IRC team and FEMA and um, work to establish this complex project, get in front of them and get this approved so that we can move it ahead. And one of the things that we're allowed to do with that would be to break out um, the contract with Stephen Associates as its own like a &E project um, to work to design these, to get some funding for that in advance. And then we would get a, this in front of them as a whole and get their approved baseline cost, which we could then pivot as part of an alternative project, which would be a new fire station and maybe other adjustments to the buildings that weren't full, put it back to codes and standards. But um, based on the public assistance rules, um, FEMA is obligated to put us whole and whole is to codes and standards, not to repair in kind. And so elevating and ADA and all of that um, as long as we're driving costs up for this baseline model as high as reasonable and it passes their cost estimating, um, that will be what establishes our baseline funding to make decisions moving forward. So are we looking at, at this point, really trying to approve two things, the uh, what should be, should be the baseline or minimum codes and standards and what should be the uh, the desired, the most desired outcome? If I could just jump in here real quick. I, I think what we're looking for today is just acceptance of the report because we want to get the report in front of FEMA. We realize that, you know, there are going to be future decisions to be made depending on what we can get reimbursed. So from here, really, it's accepting the report, then entering into a contract amendment with Stevens and Associates to do the additional work to get firmer numbers to then decide which suite of options will be most favorable for the city. Um, so we really don't necessarily need to decide which options per se, 
um, more that we would be accepting the report so we can put it forward to FEMA and then work to get a contract amendment in place to then get all those details in alignment. Right now, what we have is a really good conceptual plan and we need more information. Um, and I think, you know, in order to get those numbers, to get the reimbursements, um, I think the decision-making may be different depending on how much we're covered for. And I think if we're covered for everything, then sure, this looks great. Let's let's do it all, you know? Mm -hmm. But if we're not, then we need to have those conversations. I also will note that, you know, we've been working together as a team. We have some more internal conversations to have around sort of some of the programmatic implications as well as, um, you know, as I alluded to in the beginning, why I wanted to give like a soft introduction is, you know, uh, sort of, will we or won't we fill in the basement? Will there be a new fire station? But we need to know what the true cost of those decisions are before we can really make a full staff recommendation. We do have recommendations from Stevens and Associates within that report um, based on their professional opinion and based on what will likely garner the highest level of reimbursement. So putting that all together, it is a little convoluted. It is a little bit of one step forward, one step back. Uh, but we're getting there, I promise. Kelly, that's great. That's very helpful because clearly if you ask me the question, well, would I rather have FEMA give us $7 million or $17 million? I'd take the extra $10 million. But there may be more to it than that. <laughs> Laura. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's helpful direction of what we actually need to figure out today. Um, and like, I think the report seems good. I like the direction of the recommendations, but you know, obviously the more information is critical. I mean, the one question I have is within the report, does do you have enough flexibility? Like I just totally agree with Sal and the energy committee recommendation of like, I mean, we just lived through a climate fuel disaster. Like we should be putting any new fossil fuels in anywhere we can help it. And so if I just hope that that is that, do you have enough in the report or would that have to be some little amendment to it to direct that we want alternatives that are net zero to the, even just so we can see what those costs are and maybe fundraise separately to get to that. I think the report leads to Dora, but don't you? Oh yeah, I think, I, I, it's, I think it's very it's, conceptual at this is, point. It is Kelly conceptual said, and, and yeah. that, that would be a detail. And I'm sure that, you know, as was pointed out, there may be conversations with FEMA, whether or not they would fund that. But going forward in terms of design, even if they didn't fund it, you could always do that. You just might have to pay that part of it, right? All right. I don't want to unduly or I, I move we adopt the report. All right. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right. Thanks. Oh, great All right. Now we're up to the strategic plan, public health and safety. Well, uh, well, Evelyn's setting that up and Kelly's getting ready. Just remind you that this is the, the last of the five goals that you established and going through. And then um, the last of the three big departments, police and fire, just, justice center. Next meeting, we will be talking about the sort of principle of good governance and what we're doing, the sort of unofficial sixth goal. And we will be providing you a quick uh, similar update of the what we call admin function. So manager, finance, clerk assessing that kind of thing. Again, it won't be too long, but, uh, and then after that, we would be talking about uh, adopting the full strategic plan based on all of these conversations so that when we, as part of the retreat, then when we roll into July 1, that will be the plan for the next year to be reviewed in the spring when, after the new council comes on to see if there's a, if that's still good or, because the idea is it would be a two or three year plan, so. with metrics.
Oh, this is starting to look very familiar. Okay. <laughs> it's so familiar. Um, so we're Bill mentioned, um, we're going to be kind of cruising right through this. You've seen most of these slides just for consistency. We're going to kind of go through all the details, but we've only got one more after this. And, you know, the one more is really the administration and is not officially part of the strategic plan, but um, is a lot of the work product that we do. Um, so I'm going to go through this as quickly as possible just to keep us moving. Um, so uh, tonight we are reviewing public health and safety. Um, and... Uh, there we go. Uh, so the agenda, much like uh, the other reviews, is um, just to take a look at the plan as it stands right now, to do an initiative review, um, to talk about what's next, and then the decision items. Um, and so we're sort of in this middle of the road looking at priority action items at the 30,000 foot level. Um, moving through the strategic plan, um, we are on the last um, goal of this plan, but there's one more just to, to make sure that you've seen everything, um, but you can kind of see that here for public health and safety. Um, and then cruising right along um, through the prioritized strategies, this is what was adopted back um, just before uh, the budget. And then just moving forward with um, the strategies. So this first strategy is to provide resources for unhoused individuals. And so we have a series of strategies to provide resources. Um, we were successful in standing up a temporary winter shelter up at the Country Club Road site. Um, and then if you look on through here, there are other things that we need to work on in terms of development. So the next one is to support community partners in developing day centers um, for the unhoused population. Um, we are also looking at developing resources around restroom sanitation and potential camping opportunities. That's a, a larger conversation, um, but especially as we get into the warmer months is something that is um, certainly coming uh, into discussion with the Homelessness Task Force. Um, and then we've got peer support outreach um, is one of our initiatives in supporting uh, the folks that support us and helping people that are outside and then looking at permanent shelter and then transitional housing and looking at the full spectrum of um, services for people to, to get them off the street. The next one, this is a little wordy, but essentially um, we want to enhance emergency preparedness capacity. And so um, we've been working on this uh, related to the flood and it's super important. Um, so we're updating our continuity of operation plans with our flood after action items. Um, we're also looking at relocation of key critical equipment so that it's, you know, in within the EOC, not maybe not necessarily at the police department, but maybe up at the water plant. Um, and then just moving on to the next one, um, we are working to update our emergency management plans um, and enhancing preparedness there, looking at volunteer protocol and supply management, um, learning uh, lots of lessons uh, through the events that we've had um, and really sort of evolving as we go. Um, and then the next one is really um, intent on um, training staff and making sure that we've got uh, access to supplies and then um, making sure that we provide regular briefings of the crisis communication team, which has been pretty critical um, as we've been moving through things. So the next we've got um, emphasizing being proactive within community safety. And so um, this first one is to focus on critical safety patrols, such as speed, stop signs, and property crimes. Um, the next here is to look at the implementation of the police review committee standards and focusing on data transparency. I'm sure you've noticed that we've um, really sought to focus uh, this effort within the city manager's report. There's a lot of good data and detail provided there, but we'll continue to provide data. This next one um, is related to resources for healthy activities. And so, as we've mentioned in some of these later goals, there's a lot of overlap with other goals. And so this first one is to consider recreation opportunities up at Country Club Road. And then the next is to pursue outdoor recreation trails and uh, the green print plan. Uh, the next one is to address mental health and addiction issues. And so the initiatives associated with this one are to continue the crisis intervention training and to also um, continue to use the mobile crisis response teams through Washington County Mental Health. And then the next is to work on needle drops and Narcan distribution. 
And so what's next? Um, we are intent on developing performance measures and making sure that those come through as we report out in June. Um, and then we'll talk about council decision items coming up. So from this group, um, really the the agenda items or things that will probably come back to you for discussion are uh, resource development for unhoused individuals, whether that's through the encampment policy or um, work with our community partners. Um, we will likely have a continued review, whether it be periodical or items that we want to add to our local emergency management plan um, or the way that we deliver services in an emergency. Um, there is a need to talk about the dispatch infrastructure and the Televate study and the phases um, that is dependent on funding. Um, and then we are really focused on flood recovery and making sure that critical infrastructure is located at the command center so that then, you know, if we do have another event, we're prepared. We were prepared this time um, because we had a plan, but we also realized that there are some improvements we can make. Um, and then the next is to evaluate swift water rescue and whether or not we want to do that. Um, and then, you know, we'd be looking at recreation opportunities at Country Club Road, especially in light of um, looking at future developments. So those are the items um, on tap here. And then coming up next, um, we are almost done with reviewing each of the goals. Um, we will likely be advancing um, a plan on a maybe a three-year cycle, maybe five years, <laughs> we'll see. Um, and then um, we'll uh, complete projects and focus on incremental improvements to achieve short-term goals. And that's it. Thank you. Questions? Thanks, Kelly. Council members, go ahead, Adrian. Kelly. Um, one of the um, pieces of this particular plan, as well as I've thought more about the recreation um, plan and the parks plan. I would love to, and I've been talking to some of the community members and thinking about recreation as a source of economic boost for our city. And we're so close. Um, I would love to talk a little bit more about broadening our scope and adding adding some more goals for recreation beyond Country Club Road and beyond our recreation building. Um, I love the idea of the all around Montpelier that Alec proposed and worked with Montpelier Alive to develop some marketing materials for, but I want to think a little bit further and broader beyond outdoor activities and really encourage the city to um, I don't know, re-engage a partnership with our schools and think about how we utilize our current assets in our city. Um, we have three beautiful schools in our community. We have three beautiful gyms in our community that I think can be better utilized. Um, I think there needs to be a conversation with the schools and some type of MOU agreement on how we open up those facilities for our community members and start thinking about how do we bring in regional tournaments um, that would be a huge economic boost for our community. Um, I envision tournaments every weekend for an entire year. I know the emergency management is like, oh my gosh, we can't do that capital couple. But you know what I mean, like whatever is feasible and doable, but really thinking above and beyond what is in this plan, because I think we can we can get there. We have a lot of community partners. We have a lot of um, vested interest in our community to make this happen. And I think we need some very bold, broad goals to um, focus on recreation in our community but beyond the community or the country club road. And also thinking about the assets that the city owns and thinking outside the box of untraditional facilities in our city that could be utilized for recreation and child care that might not be like a traditional route. Um, an example might be some of our churches that we have in our in our city that um, could be an opportunity for that type of adventure. So 
perspective would like for us to encourage that and I don't know how I want to put that but that is what I want to share thanks yeah I think that's great and we uh it it never happened several years ago we had someone come to us and he was planning a big uh, disc golf tournament that was going to be uh, out at, at Wrightsville and and he he came and he made a great presentation at one council meeting and we never heard from him again so i don't know what what happened with that but but there's more than one place right here that yeah i mean i would love us to consider i mean i have two school age children and we went to aau tournaments for basketball all around new england except montpelier and so i've talked to aau coaches and they would love to host tournaments in montpelier um we are limited by access to our schools and that is a a it's you know, prohibits having events in our city um, that brings economic boost to our businesses, which we desperately need. And so I would love there to be a connection, a relationship, a conversation for that to happen in our city um, and beyond basketball. I mean, pickleball tournaments, volleyball tournaments, soccer, baseball. I mean, it's, it's endless in terms of what we can bring into our amazing city because we have the assets. I feel like we need to utilize them in a more productive way one we'll have a healthy community we'll build community around connections and we will increase our economy by bringing in all these outside visitors um, that we so desperately need and to be a a recreation hub for central vermont that is that is what i'd like to see i assume all these au tournaments that you go to the games are held in school gyms, wherever you go? Yes, so for Central Vermont, I've consulted with um, a whole bunch of coaches in our region, and they are held in middle school and high school gyms. Um, if we had a Montpelier Capital Tournament, they would most likely be held at the Main Street Middle School, the Montpelier High School, Twinfield, Spalding, Williamstown. It would be a regional um, tournament. But the goal would be, um, it's a capital tournament. It's the Montpelier tournament. We would bring them to our city and the games we would be played um, in all the neighboring schools. Yeah, we love that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Tim, do you have anybody, anybody else? Go ahead, Tim. Your thoughts? Um, I agree. I remember the old days when recreation, well, it's gone back and forth a few times, but was under the school district. Um, and, and and part of it was to be able to facilitate coordination of the use of the facilities, and it made great sense at that point. Also, running the rec department really wasn't a full-time position, and the school was also able to use that person as a facilities coordinator, so so we get kind of double mileage at that point. I'm not sure how roles may have evolved since then, but um, it was okay, but obviously it fell apart at some point and came back to the city, so I'm not sure what the politics of that one were. But you were here, Bill, baby. Um, the main thing really came uh, in trying to straighten out ed funding versus general city funding because, you know, uh, there was a lot of trading of services going on, but no real, you know, is this, are our city rec programs being paid for by Edmund and, and vice versa? So the idea was split them and then have you know, basically we would pay the school for certain things and they'd pay the rec for certain things to make it cleaner. And it actually worked, continued to work the way that you uh, described it for, for a while. It was successful. And then at some point the school made some changes and they wanted to have their own people take care of their own facility. So they hired their own staff and then they, you know, then COVID came and it became a thing about access to schools and more people in, I, you know, get that. And since COVID they've been, much stricter about sort of allowing people in the schools and damage to the buildings and those kind of things. So, um, but just the, the actual administrative split didn't stop that synergy. It was other other decisions. Thanks. And then the other pieces simply would be that we're engaged on a rec department community study, and we're also starting or working on a city plan, trying to get that going. And just as kind of watching this happen, I'm wondering 
really shouldn't the whole rec be a chapter and part of the city plan and not really a freestanding separate piece? I think, is it? I don't know. Let's, we've got the expert right here. So the recreation is a part of the community services. Obviously the city plan could be split into anything. You could make it its own chapter if you chose to, but currently as it's drafted right now, it's in the community services and Rex Park. Yeah, Rex Parks. Yeah, Senior Center. There's a number of number of ones that fall in that. So in the past, hasn't the they used to call it the master plan. Now it's the city plan, but weren't those all part of the whole endeavor? There it's the the document's been rewritten many times over the 50 years of its existence. And the current one has it really grouped in into five very odd groupings of like one's environment and one is i don't know they're they're not they're certainly not recreation certainly isn't broken out as a separate group but if you go back to uh 19 the 1990s to 2006 plan kind of in there they did have separate chapters i don't know if they had recreation as a separate chapter or if it fell under a community services with a subsection of of recreation i have to go back and and check those but we will get to decide because <laughs> it will be our plan so so when do we do this i mean because it seems like things are just kind of rolling down the highway right. Right? and when do we say gosh it really recreations and goals it's in the strategic plans we've got and if it's not part of the city plan what are we doing yeah so i think the the, the practical answer at least in terms of where we're at right now is if if you all agree with the general outline that Adrian just provided, we can put some draft language into the strategic plan that you'll be looking at next meeting and at least set that. And then we can figure if we're going to add that to the, the master plan. In the meantime, I mean, a lot of it's going to be planning for this and we're about to do rec planning. So if this is what we're looking at, that's a good time to be engaging this group to have a community conversation. And in the meantime, the council might want to think about reaching out maybe to the school board for some kind of joint meeting or joint committee or something like that uh, to start looking at these things and re maybe rebuild that relationship. I don't know. Point of, the last point I'd make to try to answer Tim's question on how these all dovetail together. When uh, Cameron and I were working together, um, former city assistant city manager, working together on, on how these two plans, the city plan and the strategic plan would dovetail together. Uh, the idea was that, and it was obviously gonna be iterative because we have to kind of get there, was that um, the city plan would be laying out in the eight year plan. And it's gonna have a number of initiatives of different priorities, but we can't do them all at once, but it would end up being a palette of ideas of we've established our goals, We've established our vision, and here are a number of strategies for us to get there. And then these would start to get incorporated into our strategic plan of if we're going to get there, you know, uh, whether it's homelessness or recreation, we have a recreation goal, we have some strategies, how are we going to get there, and what's going to go into this year's strategic plan, and what's going to go into our budgets. And the hope was that we would start to be able to have you know, what's our long-term vision? I think that's your question. What's our long-term vision in recreation? How are we going to get there? Well, we can't get there in one step. But if we've got the vision in the master plan, and then we start building those strategies and those steps into our um, strategic plans every year, then we can get there. And we may have to amend that over in, in, over time. But that was the, the big picture of how these two documents would nest together. But how we get these nested together over the next year, thats it's going to take a little bit of iterative process because obviously we haven't adopted the city plan yet, but we'll keep working back and forth and hopefully they fit together when we get them adopted. In, in terms of what we were talking about working with the schools, I'm sure that you know if people, whether council said yes to it or not, I'm sure that Bill and I could reach out to the uh, superintendent and maybe the chair of the school board and say, let's sit down and talk about this um, to see what the opportunities are. Cause, cause I would, I would love to see that. I don't see anybody saying no.
Anything else on this? All right, thanks, Kelly. We're we'll be look, looking at this again as part of the package next month. Um, Public Safety Department's overview. How are we doing? I'm Eric Nordenson from the police department. A uh, quick overview of our police department, our dispatch center, and also our community service officers, also known as parking. Uh, a quick agenda to kind of stay on course. Uh, I'll tell you about, about us, who we are, what we do. Uh, I'll give you a quick rundown of our organizational charts, uh, what our core services are. Um, some big challenges that I think, you know, everybody else has identified. Um, I've always thought with every challenge comes a couple opportunities. So we've identified some of those. And then I think we have a lot of good things in the works. So I'd like to share those with you. So here's my problem. I've got readers on and I can't see. <laughs> okay, there we go. About us, we are a 24 hour police department and dispatch center. Uh, our dispatchers dispatch for 28 different communities, uh, tw 19 communities, 28 different agencies in those communities, two police departments. Um, we're currently staffed with 14 full-time police officers. We're authorized for 17 of those. Uh, we have one of those positions on hold due to budgets. Um, we have eight uh, full-time dispatchers. They're, we're full there, which is great. Um, we have two vacancies in police. Um, I do have a new person who just graduated college getting ready to start in June. So we're pretty excited to get him. Um, our parking division is staffed with one full-time, two part-time community service officers. And we do share an admin with uh, the fire department whose specialty is basically ambulance billing. Uh, does a really nice job with that for us. Kind of our structure, as you can see, um, you know, we're, we're a kind of a paramilitary organization. So it starts with the chief. And then I have a deputy chief, Kevin Moulton, who is incredible to work with um, for us. And then, so Kevin pretty much supervises the parking division there. Um, dispatch um, also goes through Kevin and I, and then we have a dispatch supervisor, Carrie McCool, and a senior dispatcher, Danny Frattini. Um, for the police side, as you can see, it goes through me uh, and Kevin. Uh, we also have Bonnie, who's our admin. Um, we have five sergeants, two corporals, and the rest are police officers. Uh, you'll see that uh, Carter Pelzel is our new hire. He's from Worcester, grew up locally, went to U32. Uh, and also, I'm very happy he's a Castleton grad like myself. <laughs> I'll always call it Castleton. So uh, I finally got one from there, so I'm, I'm pretty happy to get him. Um, the good news, too, is we have three good applicants in the pool right now. Uh, we've kind of readjusted our, our goals to focus on new hires and train them the way we want to train them. Uh, so we're going to hold that vacancy until we find the right one for us. So what we do, um, law enforcement, we do a minimum of two officers on each uh, shift and we cover for 24 hours. Uh, that's a change from three officers on every shift. And we did that to budgets uh, to try and get to budgets. We're finding it's a little tricky sometimes. Uh, so we're probably going to revisit that, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. The two's a little tricky when we have to transport people and things like that. We're leaving the town a little covered that I'm not real happy with. So it uh, puts a little stress on, on some of the staff. Um, we provide a full spectrum of police services from crash investigations to major investigations. Um, we have a high training standard. Um, we've built a really robust internal training uh, program. Um, so we send a lot of our our officers out to instructor level trainings and then we have them train our officers. Um, it's a good way to kind of build their 
their leadership ability and it also you know gives them some purpose and value um, which they really appreciate um, we have an embedded mental health clinician which we're partnered with Barry City we share that 50 percent of the time so we see about 20 hours of service from her a week and then Barry City also sees about 20 hours it's a great partnership for us and with Barry if we ever need her and she's not in Montpelier she can come over so it's, it's not that big of a deal if she's not here um, and the partnership we have with Washington County mental health is second to none um, they're actually going to be sending us some mobile crisis people and we'll we're going to start some real active uh, outreach to the community. Basically tomorrow morning we start. Um, parking enforcement, we we do that. That's been down quite a bit due to the flood, which you guys can see it's reflected in the budget. Um, you know, I think there's a balance between making sure the businesses get back and the revenue side. And I think our priority has been making sure the businesses get back. So there is certainly a, a reduction in that budget, but I think uh, we all agree that getting the downtown businesses back up and running is, should be our priority. Um, we do a lot of referrals to Turning Point and other support services. Uh, that's an alcohol and substance abuse uh, and misuse program. Uh, so we try and get people the help they need in the place that they are. And those are peer runs. So those are people that actually experienced that type of uh, issue in their own personal life and can help solve those problems. Uh, we do dispatch, which I explained, and we do the investigations. Our budget, as you can see, is a little under 20, uh, 2.7 million. I'd like to say I'm um, incredible and saved us some money from last year, but what we did was just reshuffled a little bit of money that you'll see in another slide to more accurately reflect uh, parking. Uh, we do a significant lift on the police side from parking, so we reshuffled some of the salaries from there. So it, while it looks like I saved a bunch of money, some of it just got pushed to a different bucket. For dispatch, about a little over a million. And we have about 400, 420,000 in contracts as well to those different agencies in the Capitol Police. And then uh, for parking, as you can see, the increase there is reflective of the shuffle of the, the funds to more accurately reflect what we're into. Some challenges and opportunities. I, I can't go without the, the picture always gets me. Uh, if you look at the picture on the left, uh, that's our team, our bowling team. <laughs> There's a 19 year old and there's a 50 something year old and they're all incredible friends and join a bowling team together. Um, and they're called the polite department. So uh, we're always accused of being the Montpelier polite department. And I've always been quite proud of that. Uh, and they, they showed it off on their bowling pictures. So uh, I had to, I had to smile when I saw the picture. Um, for us, and I think it's reflected in our uh, budget for this year, we asked for and we're given uh, more training money and more travel money. If you go onto the police academy website, the access to training is very, very limited. Um, when you get to year three or four in your career, there's really nothing left that the state's offering other than the mandatory stuff. So professional growth is very limited. Um, so we're pushing to travel out of state or bringing training here that is sometimes costly. Again, we've got regularly scheduled in-house trainings. Um, so we're doing a lot of that internally. We schedule that on times when we're, we're heavier shift. Every Thursday between two and six is a great opportunity for us to train. Uh, every Thursday we have every officer available at the police department. It's our heaviest day. So between two and six, we typically have the most people. So we use that opportunity to train people. So it limits the overtime that we have. Um, for budget reductions, we saw the capital improvement plan. I, it says that we don't have any money in that. Um, you guys funded our dispatch consoles that we're paying for over three years. So uh, we didn't get any new money for uh, cruisers or anything else like that, but we are certainly being funded for things that we had in that CIP plan. Um, and there was, there was other departments that had some serious needs. So um, this year we felt like we were able to sustain not having any money from that. Uh, also gave us an opportunity to look at the electric vehicles. And I know net zero has been a pretty big priority for everybody. And I, uh, I have not not listened. Um, I'm just trying to find a police cruiser that is electric that is not going to die on the side of the road in an hour. Um, so, so Chevy has come up with one. I have yet to see it. I'm hoping to see it at the Chiefs conference um, and see and and hear how it's working. Um, if there is one and it's affordable and we can get it, I'm going to get it. I just want to make sure it's going to make it through a Vermont winter for us. So uh, staffing's. As I told you, the, uh, there's some reductions on our shifts, um, which makes it a little tricky for us to respond to certain things. Um, but the opportunity in that is it gives our officers some rest. 
um, you know, this the, this younger generation, and I'm sure they said it about me, um, you know, enjoys their time off and their work ba- their work life balance is incredibly like a priority for them. Um, so if you're not hearing that as an employee and an employer, like you're not listening. Uh, so you know that as much as people like overtime, they don't necessarily want the overtime that we all used to like. Uh, many years ago. So the balance of lightening the shift has let people have some time off, which has been great. Uh, what's next? I like to be a little positive. On, uh, so there's a lot of good things coming. Um, as you've heard, we have flood recovery in the city. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows how much time that actually takes, um, but it's a lot of time. And you know, the folks behind me have done incredible work and and then we're still doing our main jobs. So it, it's a lot. That's our number one thing right now is to get the city back on its feet and it's not going to happen tomorrow. This is a long process. So um, my other big push and, and Sarah's probably getting annoyed with me cause, uh, is building our secondary emergency dispatch center. Yes, we have a cube. Yes, the plan worked. It went off without a hitch. But can we make it better and have it set up so all that panic and move and and all the the difficult times, we just literally go up there and it's ready. Um, so that's our goal. Um, and also, if you go into my building, you'll see the radio and all the infrastructure was put in the basement. I need it out of there. I, I, it's a number one stressor for me for our equipment is if something happens, it's in the water. Uh, so we're working on that. Um, I obtained some resources uh, for a data consultant to evaluate the crisis worker program. So we have a way now to look at data and we're modeling it after Portland, Maine's model of collecting data, which uh, is very basic, but it was better than what we had. And then we're publicly posting that information so everybody can see what she has to say about the work that she's doing. Um, we are working on a quality assurance program for dispatch with uh, data posted to the website. That's still to come. We're doing data quality analysis uh, basically by by hand. Uh, and they make some computer programs that make it a little bit more effective. Uh, of course, I learned about this after the budget. So we'll talk about that for next year to see if we can modernize that, that technique there. We work incredibly closely with federal, state, and local partners for resource and information sharing. Um, we have an FBI task force officer who does investigations with child sex crimes with the FBI. Um, most people probably don't know that. Um, we are signing up an ATF task force officer for the drug and gun violence in our community. Um, it gives us an automatic connection to the federal system, um, which is incredibly helpful, and the resources that they bring. We've been able to bring in an uh, Intel analyst uh, who helps with uh, uh, our investigations and all the investigations in the area. Uh, been a great resource. She works for Homeland Security. She lives locally and she was working from home and wanted to have more activity. So our entire Washington County has been using her resources incredibly well. Um, we're continuing to build the, <clears throat> excuse me, the crisis intervention training model. If you aren't familiar with CIT, it's, uh, it's the first of its kind here in the state. We built it from the ground up. Um, we've held three classes, trained 45 different people from mental health to police and EMS and brought a lot of different backgrounds to the table. So it's a big work. We've presented our program to the Department of Mental Health Conference in Vermont, and I'm pretty excited. Uh, IACP, which is the International Association Chiefs of Police, we're presenting that in Boston in October. So we're doing a lot of good things here in our community. Um, I'm still working to build a regional TAC team, which is a tactical ready team. So in the event that something really bad happens here, um, not only Montpelier PD is ready, but everybody else that is going to be coming to Montpelier is also ready and that we all work th- together. Um, I spent a lot of time seeking grant funding and for equipment, staff, enforcement efforts. And I'm trying to apply for a DOJ COPS grant to get a 17th officer. I think I have enough good candidates to get to that point. Um, and I'd really like to uh, to do that. Dealing with the DOJ and the COPS grant is not the easiest thing. So uh, I have two more weeks to try and navigate that process. And we're, we're trying. Um, you know, my big push here for you is the national standard for police officers in communities our size are 2.4 officers per thousand. So I should be at about 19.2 police. If you wanted to give me 19, I'd say yes. Um, that The important piece of this, <laughs> you're like, well, why do we say that? Uh, you know, in four to five years, when we start talking about strategic planning, there's four, four or five years, four of us are going to be gone. Uh, if you're at 15 and you lose four, you're down to 11 again, and we're back in a pinch. So at some point, we really need to start thinking about ramping up uh, for that exit. 
Uh, so it's on the back of my mind. I just need to make sure that it's ready to go. Um, we have certainly trained our future leaders. They'll be ready to go in four or five years, but I got to fill in the bottom part uh, and with, as soon as we can. So um, I think you, you all have seen the, the website. Um, has I've listened to the PRC. They've wanted a public facing dashboard. I asked Valcor, which is our record management system to help us develop that. Of course, they tell me that it's going to be ready July 1st. They didn't tell me how much it is. Uh, I always laugh. I said, can you tell me before we do our budget? But they don't. Um, so we will find a way to make sure that publicly facing dashboard when it's available is, is provided. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we will do it. There you go. How do you like that? They told you July 1st. They just didn't say what you were. <laughs> you just triggered a 911 call for Sarah. Yeah, I, I know. I, you, you put a little pressure. So uh, as you can see, we are pretty active in the community. Um, we, do, we do a lot of great things. We have a lot of great people. Um, and I think we as a city have a great team. I'm, I'm thrilled every day when I come to work to, to be around the people that I'm around. Um, and it, you can see just from the pictures of us and the, the rainbow picture is actually one of my favorites. It was from the day after the flood. Um, and it kind of gave us, gave us a little hope and a little smile when we got back to the PD and we're like, okay, we're back. But um, anyways, any questions? I went over my five minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> Lauren. Thanks chief. Um, not really a question, but just a reflection. So with a lot of new members. So the chief mentioned the PRC, the police review committee. So in 2020, like following the murder of George Floyd, the city council created a police review committee. Jack and I both served on it. It was a really intensive year or so process. Um, the chief and others were there. It was like weekly hours and hours and hours, but we did this really exhaustive look and tried to kind of poke at you know, what are what are the ways that we can make sure we have the best police department? And I'm just really grateful to see so many, you know, it was like recruiting the right people. And I think the approach you take, you know, to make sure we're bringing in great people, the training is so important, the culture that you create, the um, the data transparency, like, I feel like all of all of the big like themes and values are really reflected. And I'm just really grateful. And like, it really stuck with me in that process. Like a lot of what we did were like interviews with people that interact with our police department. And it was just such like overwhelmingly positive feedback. And it was like, we have a great department and just continuing to kind of lean into those values and that culture. So just thanks and like grateful for the ongoing work to keep reflecting that and just wanted to share that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I I I agree 100%. I it's been a tough year. I mean, budgeting was tough. I really appreciated your leadership and willingness to try some things. They're not all working great, but um, we're learning something. I also greatly appreciate the transparency and all the communication that you put out there. I mean, I enjoy reading those logs probably as much as you guys do put them together. But it's it's it's. Um, it's just nice to to see a group that um, obviously likes what they do and and do it so well. And I think that has a lot to do with your leadership. So thank you for that. I completely agree. I was going to say say this in my mayor's report at the end, but uh, we had the corporate cup last week, and uh, I talked to the people who organized it, and they said it was so great to work with. Uh, work with the police and fire and everybody in public works and everybody here in the city and uh, putting it together, very professional, very smooth to deal with. And so great work on that. Um, I think we need to be proud of our police department. Like, don't talk yourself okay, out of here. You <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thanks. All right, thank you.
All right. All right. Just um, real quickly before I get started, because I thought about it after I went and sat down from the emergency management plan and and um, I have Evelyn behind me. When I submitted the plan that you've all seen, I've heard back from both um, uh, Keith Kubin from Central Mountain Regional Planning and Vermont Emergency Management being so complimentary about the city's community crisis plan and saying, boy, we wish all of our communities had a uh, communication crisis plan that and, and it was attached to their plan. So I, I forgot to say that, but yeah, it's, yeah, we got a lot of good compliments on that. Bro. Great. All right. So very similar um, agenda to the uh, Chief Norrinson. Talk a little bit about us, how we s serve our community, a little bit of budget overview, some challenges, and and then finally, what's next for me? So about us, the department provides that we uh, do both fire and ambulance. Uh, our personnel are trained as firefighters, paramedics, and EMTs. And along with that, we uh, maintain all of um, our, do as much of our vehicle and equipment uh, maintenance as we can. And we also maintain the building. If you've been by recently in the last few days, you've seen, oh, it's been about a couple of weeks now, it's the annual spring cleaning of the building. And the firefighters clean that building from top to bottom. Every room gets stripped out, washed, walls, ceilings, floors, waxed. And it takes about three weeks to a month, depending on how busy they are, but that's ongoing right now. Uh, the crews get out daily and perform a, a pre-plan inspection. Uh, we do public education programs, and of course we respond to emergencies. And in addition to uh, the city of Montpelier, our ambulance service, uh, we uh, have contracts with three surrounding towns, Middlesex, Bourntown, and Worcester for their ambulance service. And as you can see, our ambulance service revenues and contracts, uh, it provide over 20% of um, the fire department's budget. <laughs> <laughs> our mission, and I'll just quickly read it, the mission of the Montpelier Fire and Ambulance Department is to save lives, protect property, and preserve the tax base in Montpelier at a reasonable and acceptable cost to the taxpayer. And then our uh our staff um obviously it starts with me and then we as uh chief norton Sidden mentioned we have a public safety service administrator that we share with the police bonnie Beralt, um and then a deputy fire chief james quinn and i'd like to see all of these evelyn how can i see the whole <laughs> I just want to see way. Yeah. No, this is annoying. It never likes to. Right, All right. Thanks. There. So I'll just quickly go through. Thank you. So we have five uh, firefighter paramedics Keith Taylor, Mark Trudson, John Liu, Daniel Peterson, and Jacob Timian. Our six lieutenants are Leon Eggleston, Nichols Brissett, Daniel Ruggles, Jacob Larrabee, Chad Morris, and Kenneth Grisman. And then firefighters Peter Thurston, Andrew Marino, Justin Redman and Caden Juro. And you're fully staffed now, right? Yes, we are. We're fully staffed. Some of our core services, um, obviously the first one and most important is our, our emergency call response. And that the call, those call numbers you have there are for uh, last year. We had a total of 2,045, and of that, uh, 1,279 were emergency ambulance calls. In our training department, uh, we do our annual EMS and fire recertification. So every year, um, we have, whether you're an EMT or a paramedic or advanced EMT, there's an annual recertification that's involved there, and fire also. If you're a fire one, fire two, or office fire officer, those all require an, an annual recertification. We have our ongoing EMS um, training program, which is conducted by our own paramedics. So it's an in-house program. That, and when when we started the paramedic program, that was one of the um, things we had talked about, things we wanted to accomplish that 
Our ongoing EMS training program would be conducted by in-house by our own paramedics. Uh, we have an ongoing fire training program that's uh, conducted in-house also. And we have one of our lieutenants who is assigned to fire training. Uh, just quickly on the paramedic program a little more, um, we would love to expand that program and I would love to see more and I hope to have more. Um, unfortunately, we have a very small turnover in the department. And so without turnover, we are, aren't able to hire new people. And so the, the, the paramedic program is growing a little s slower than I wanted, but it's it's a good thing also. It's because we have such very little turnover. Most of our people retire out and they don't they don't leave. Are there incentives for people in-house to uh, go through the certification to become EMTs and then paramedics? Yes, there is. And actually, um, our uh, Jacob Timian, our newest paramedic, went through the, the program while while employed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he went through the the uh, BTC program as an employee. So and and all everyone has to be an EMT, and in fact, most have the advanced EMT. But the the paramedic program is a big leap. Um, it's a lot of time and work. It's a big effort. So they do get paid more, and there's an incentive. And I think we do provide some funding for that training, but it's it's a couple of year commitment, right? It's not yes. it's not two classes in your paramedic. No, no. And and actually the program is no longer in existence. So that program has failed. And yeah. So yes, and our other fire firefighter EMTs are advanced level EMTs, everyone except myself are mm -hmm. advanced level EMTs. And then um we our fire prevention activities, as I mentioned, um we do a daily pre-plan inspection where the crews go out um, and we've kind of broken it up. Some of the crews do schools and some do public buildings and some do the nursing homes. And so, but we try and get a crew into a building in the city. Um, we try and our goal is every day. It doesn't always work that way if they're busy or cleaning the kitchen like today tore it all apart, things like that. But, and they've had a busy day. But so, we, our goal is to get out every day to a building. So if a building or if a business or some other building wanted to get a, get an inspection just to make sure everything was safe, they could just call you? Yes, just call and we will schedule it. That happens. Um, sometimes the, the crews could be out doing an inspection at a store or a downtown building or any building and somebody from an, another notices them, call up, say, hey, I saw your your firefighters were in, uh, could they come to my building? Mm -hmm. So that happens a lot. Yep. And then it, also- There's two benefits to that too. I think people should understand this. One, it, they're not a code, they're not a code enforcement group. So they're there and they, they, they you know, help some, you know, they can give people tips of what they see, but it's also putting our firefighters in buildings when they're not filled with smoke and flame. So they can learn there's a back stairway that might drop mm. or the oil tank is here and they're taking notes of that. So it's, you know, if they hopefully never get, have to go into that building in a crisis situation, they have some sense of the layout. So it's, it's good really for everybody. Mm. And, and we work closely with uh, Michelle Savory, the building inspector. Um, oftentimes uh, the crews could be out even on an ambulance call and notice something and they'll reach out to Michelle and say, Hey, we were in this building and, we think you might want to go take a look at. So there's a lot of back and forth between the firefighters, the crews, and uh, our city building inspector and health officer, for that matter. Mm -hmm. You know, notice things that they think the health officer should take a look at. So our budget is, um, as you can see, it's two thousand or two million six fifty one. It's an increase of almost 5% at 123,000. And uh, like similar budgets, it's uh, mostly driven by personnel, personnel costs. Some challenges and opportunities. And I think that we'll start with the biggest opportunity. We're gonna welcome a new fire chief. And when we welcome a new fire chief, we're gonna welcome some new energy, some new excitement, some new ideas. and. So uh, I think we're all looking forward to that, getting the, getting the new fire chief in and on board and uh, seeing some, so what can happen? Some new opportunities, some new energy there. 
weather related events um obviously a challenge now and i let me i'm just going to skip over that for a second and i'm going to come back to it because i think that's people might want to talk a little more about that so um reducing overtime that's a challenge of ours we're looking at it we're looking at uh, all all opportunities to try and reduce overtime and it, it's difficult to try and maintain the staffing we need keep up with the call volume and um but but try and find a way to get overtime under control. Flood recovery re uh, renovations to the firehouse. Um, it's a really a, a big priority. Um, if you've been in, I think most of you have been into the station since the flood. It's really a mess. It's, it's hard to work in there. We have no first floor offices. Everything is now on the second floor. Um, I share an office with the deputy chief and uh, we have a, like an EMT, uh, secure area that we're required to have because of HIPAA. Well, that's all we're, that's now all with me. And so we're in, we're using the hallway, the second floor hallway for the Lieutenant's office area. And, um, that's new. We were in the, the ex, we did have them set up in the exercise room. We've now, we've gotten them out into the hallway, just trying to figure out different ways to make it work. But it's, it's really a challenge to work in the building now and the way it is. And we're, but we understand that it's a, it's a process and we're working on it. Um, continuing to build the paramedic program, as I had mentioned earlier, I'd already talked about that. We would love to increase the size of it. It's just, um, we have such low turnover that, um, and um, we've not had um, any other interest in current employees going through the process. And now there's not an in-state program, so it, they'd have to go out of state to, um, uh, to get that. And then vehicle replacement. Um, vehicles are expensive. And, and we know, you you all know that the, the tower truck is going on 30 years old and eventually we're going to have to to address that. And it's, it's, an, it's a one and a half million dollar piece of equipment and takes three years to get. You know, if you ordered one today, it would show up in three years and so there's, there's so many challenges around that. We have a, an ambulance that needs to be replaced and that Sarah has that on the list. And uh, we had the vehicle that we lost in the RK Miles fire. And we're we're in the process of um, hopefully within a couple of weeks um, being able to um, at least start the process of replacing that. Um, we've been looking at some used vehicles and we think we've identified one that will fit fit our needs locally that we we um could possibly purchase so and so let's just jump back weather related events um that's probably our biggest challenge when i talk to um fire chief friends from around new england and beyond and and we talk about what are your biggest challenges obviously over time and things like that but every one is weather related events and the problem is um like vehicle replacement, overtime, budgets, all that. We have control over that. We don't always like the decisions we we have to make, but we have control over it. Weather-related events, we just do not have any control over it. It occupies a lot of our time. It occupies a lot of our thought process of what we're you know, being being prepared. And that's all we can do is being as prepared as we possibly can when the next, and I know we, we talk a lot about flooding for obvious reasons. Montpelier floods a lot. Um, in my uh, 45 years, uh, I've been through three major floods and I think four, I was trying to think the other day, four minor floods in 45 years. That's seven floods and uh, four, or four near misses. So we, you know, we just have to, you know, stay on top of that and pay attention to it. And it's not, we talk a lot about flooding in Montpelier, but we also have to be concerned about heat emergencies. You now it's it's only May, and uh, we already had you know three or four very warm days, and so we you know as we think about our homeless population and our elderly population, and we worry about heat and making sure we are able to handle those, having a, a cooling space for them. Um, other things, you know. Um, Ice storms. I was uh, 
I, I attend all the National Weather Service briefings and rundowns, and we always do a spring flood uh, seminar. And when we talk about that, um, the National Weather Service says it's, it's because of the way our winters are acting right now, it's it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. Someday we're going to have a devastating ice storm similar to the one. The last one was in 1998, and it affected mostly Champ the Champlain Valley. Just missed us. Just missed us. And that was it was devastating. We, Montpelier Fire Department, actually sent a crew up, and we were we worked out of uh, South Arrow. And we were there three days helping with that. So that it's it's the National Weather Service, it's on their radar. They talk about it all the time. That and it's a, a real concern. They worry about it because of the way our winters are acting now. You know, you know, a, an ice storm would be devastating. So those are some of our challenges and opportunities. And then finally, what's next? What's next for me is retirement. <laughs> Is retirement. Um, but I just wanted to, uh, so I added a little something to it, because I just wanted to say, yes, I'm going to be, you know, passing the torch. I guess that's not the right word to the new, <laughs> <laughs> to the new, to the new fire chief. At least, as I said, we see that as an opportunity, but I'm not going to, yes, I'm doing that, but I'm not going to be going away. I, I think I still have some energy and some desire to continue to help the city any way I can. And whether it's resilience or, I, I do want to continue working on the on the plan, the, the operations plan, and I don't know. Maybe I'll join Adrian's tournament committee. And <laughs> you mentioned pickleball, it kind of caught my eye. So, so maybe maybe something like that. But yeah, I I I, I plan to be around and I continue to help out in the city in in any way that the, I can or or you 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 would like. So with that, I don't know if there's any questions. Okay, thanks. All Does right. anyone have any questions? Good. You you covered it so well. We don't have questions for you. <laughs> thanks a lot. Okay. Carol Plant Community Justice Center. Um, so I'll, I am really going to try to keep it to five minutes for you because it's getting late. Um, I'm going to start by just saying that our mission really is to um, find peaceful approaches to resolution for crime and conflict in the community. And we really engage people that live in the community to help us do that. So we have a lot of volunteers that actually implement the work that we do. Um, our staff, um, oh, I'm not seeing all of the text under here, but that's okay. Um, so these are some of our programs. Um, the Community Conflict Assistance Program, which is where we do neighbor um, neighbor disputes and other kinds of resolution between people. Um, we do mediation for those folks. The Restorative Outreach Services is for people who have been impacted by crime, but where there's no um, actual charge for that. So we do outreach to those folks to find out what their needs are based on the experience that they had. Um, we do restorative reentry services, which is our circles of support and accountability and our transitional housing program. So those programs are specifically for people who are coming out of incarceration and coming back into the community and they need the extra support. Um, and what we've found with most of those folks is that they have uh, lots of times co-occurring um, substance use, substance misuse, and also mental health challenges. They also have long trauma histories. And so um, with the extra support of people that are 
not the necessarily the folks that they used to so associate with when they come back into the community. They get support to see and create a vision for themselves for the life that they want. Okay, well, that'll, be, that'll be helpful. Um, I can keep talking anyway. So the community uh, education and dialogue is uh, we offer a couple of different classes for folks who need some extra support and education. One is our insights into conflict. So that's helping people understand how they operate in conflict, what conflict looks like, and find some better skills um, and ways to, to manage their own conflict. So we're really looking at helping people um, do things for themselves, empower people to, to do that for themselves. So, so um, conflicts that they have don't rise to the level of having to call the police department and, and have uh, the police get involved or have some criminal activity happen as a result. We also do a parenting with respect class, which is for men who um, whose children are involved with DCF on some level. They also are people who have uh, most of the time some trauma history and uh, have some difficulty with really figuring out how to parent and it was specifically designed for men who have had gaps in the time that they spend with have spent with their children so because of incarceration or because they've been uh, you know in families that are separated and that sort of thing um, and then the last one is we offer um, co-facilitation for a program called Revisions, which is a domestic violence accountability program. So Alfred co-facilitates that program. And um, that is also part of our re our community education and dialogue. So that's serving men who have domestic violence um, cr criminal histories. All right, so going back to our organizational chart, you can see here, um, I'm the director. Alfred Mills is our reentry and transitional housing specialist. Um, Rick Pereira is our restorative programs coordinator and currently our, out, our uh, restorative outreach specialist position is vacant. We haven't filled that position because we are not sure yet what our fiscal year 25 budget is going to be been involved in the legislative process and working with DOC to find out what that's going to look like. So we're always uh, hanging on by our fingernails to figure that out, and we may not know for another few weeks. Um, I do have more information about that. Um, you can see that in uh, on the slide also that we, like I said, we have program volunteers. We've got about 50 volunteers right now. They actually implement the the panel processes. So the restorative justice panels are for, we get two referrals from two different places. So we either get pre-charge referrals, which is direct referrals from the police department, and we get them from four different agencies, Berlin, Northfield, Montpelier, and also Vermont State Police. Um, and we also get referrals for people who are on probation. And so those reparative referrals, we do the same process, um, but it's just a different referral source. So the pre-charge referrals, they have a different opportunity basically to have that charge dismissed as opposed to going through the court system and having a criminal offense on their record. Um, there you go. The transitional housing program, we have, um, it's short-term housing for people coming out of incarceration. So it's giving them an opportunity to have a stable place to be while they find employment and get their feet under them and meet all of the conditions for either furlough or parole or probation, however they come out. Um, those two apartments, um, you know, we turn over as much as we can during the year and we move people into permanent housing. Um, this is some of our data I just had last year and this year we're on track with our um, with the number of cases. So the reparative probation, they're higher this year. Our direct reparative, those are the cases that come directly from the court. So a judge can decide that they want somebody to do a restorative process. And if they complete that process, um, they will dismiss their case. So they have that opportunity. We don't get very many of those, as you can see. The criminal direct are those pre-charge cases that I was talking about. Those are a lot lower this year, but these are normal kind of fluctuations in what we see from year to year. So we, we really just never know. There are lots of outside uh, forces that influence whether we get cases or not. 
Um, we do have re relationships, again, with all of our uh, referring agencies, and we remind them regularly um, that they can do these referrals to us. The other conflict assistant, the other cases are conflict assistance program, and we also accept cases from the schools. We do charge the schools outside of the Montpelier schools when they do those direct referrals. Transitional housing in the circles of support and accountability. Again, the, this is typical for us. We're meeting our grant deliverables with these numbers, and this is actually higher than what um, they've asked us to do. So typically we are asked to process eight COSA teams and, do, uh, and have people in our transitional housing, um, about eight people per year. So some of the challenges that we're facing, like I said, that as of today, the funding, we are still not, um, we still don't know, but we've been, it's been suggested by the Department of Corrections that we revert to uh, the, our, the base of our funding to fiscal year 22, which is $177,000, which is approximately 9% reduction from fiscal year 24. Um, in fiscal year 24, our Department of Corrections funding and all of this is so we, we don't impact the general fund. So all of our work is done um, from the, this grant funding that we get. So um, with the transitional housing and our base grant, it comes to about 324,000. And then our domestic violence accountability program funding for the parenting with respect to class is another 27,000. Um, we asked for 24 and they gave us 27. So they're really supportive of us and continuing to develop that program. Um, so in any case, um, what I found out today was that we think it's going to be 177,000. And then um, there's a legislative council that may be allocating an additional 21,000 to us. And then we've been told we're also getting a 3% COLA on top of that. So we may end up in our base grant funding 203,000 and then another 110,000 for the transitional housing, and I'm anticipating the 27,000 from the DVAP as well. Um, another challenge for us, the transitional housing, um, because of the lack of affordable housing, the housing options for moving people into permanent housing, both from transitional housing and the other way that we can help people move into permanent housing is sometimes directly when they come out of incarceration. So if they're stable, they have some funding and they have a job and they can sign a lease for themselves, we could move. And we used to do this a lot. Um, we're not able to do that at all. So in the last four years since COVID, we do not, we're not able to do that part of our program, which is a disadvantage. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, because I think that that having, you know, trying to work toward having our volunteer base be more reflective of the community and find more diversity, and because we do a fair amount of youth cases, it's important to me that we try to continue to redevelop our youth panel program. The difficulty there is that we need the support really of the schools, the a way to get to the kids who might be interested in doing this program. Um, and that's been a challenge. So, you know, understanding what, how difficult they have every day, they're working, you know, in the schools and what they have facing them. Um, but we keep trying to engage uh, youth and find ways to do that um, in addition to working on um, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion for ourselves, educating ourselves, and then looking at the broader community and how we can connect into other networks and other resources to be able to create a more diverse pool of volunteers. So for, uh, I think I'm behind on these. Um, okay, so I wasn't. Opportunities. Uh, so more diversified funding with the the uh, Domestic Violence Council grant for the parenting class and the revenue from the revisions program. Um, that's helpful for us. It gives us a little bit of cushion with some unrestricted funds that don't get spent down. Program expansion of the parenting with respect. We have, I trained uh, four new facilitators this year. So the, we have the ability, I have the ability to subcontract with those facilitators um, because the workload for me to <laughs> facilitate the class myself and do all of the admin behind that is, uh, it's a lot of extra work. So I'm really happy about that. And our next goal is to develop a version of this 
class that will be for women. So I get re asked regularly if there's a class for women. So there are lots of moms who also uh, could use some different kinds of parenting skills. And the class really focuses on the children and also helps them. It's restorative. It's it's restorative in nature in that we're asking them to be self-reflective about the decisions is, that they make, the challenges that they have, and understanding how their decisions and actions are impacting their children, and then helping them find a, a way to go forward in a, a different way to go forward. Possible expansion of the outreach specialist position is also on my list. Um, there's an organization called PH International out of Waitsfield that's collaborating right now with the town of Waterbury. And they've invited us to be part of this grant proposal and uh, which would, it would almost double the hours. So right now, um, the person that we had in place was working 12 hours a week for our outreach specialist position. And this would almost double that amount. Um, if that goes through, it's a pilot program that this organization wants to develop. And this person would be doing basically the same job that they're doing here, which is outreach to people who need the support. And I didn't say this before, but that position also works with anybody who's been named, um, who's been victimized with one of the referrals that we get for our restorative justice panels. Um, so they really um, are looking for some alternative ways to address some of the things that are happening in Waterbury. So, and we serve the whole Western half of the county. And so um, I'm happy to partner with them, provided they have some financial support for us to do that. Um, fiscal year 25, this is exciting that the Department of Corrections is actually, actually recognizing that they want to provide a 3% cost of living increase. Uh, this is something that is really good for recruitment and retention for the positions that we have. Um, it's not been done before. We went many, many years with level funding and level funding to me means a cut. Um, so that's being acknowledged and that's with a lot of support from the legislature right now. Um, diversifying the volunteer cadre, like I said before, that's really important. Uh, there's been a change in the Department of Corrections policy regarding clearance for our volunteers. So what we used to have to do was submit an application and then the, the DOC would do the background check for folks. Now the only uh, background checks that they're doing and applications they are accepting are for people who might go into a facility. So one of the prisons in Vermont. And so that would apply just for the circles of support and accountability volunteers. And we don't have a lot of turnover with those folks. So what this does is it broadens who we can reach out to to become volunteers for us. And the most exciting thing is that we can have people with lived experience. So we're going to need to develop our own policy that the city will have to also buy into, and we might need to get a um, city attorney to look at this policy to make sure that we're covered. But we are going to do background checks for all of our volunteers, but we won't have the limitation of somebody having been uh, in the criminal justice system and having to wait two years to apply to become a volunteer and jump through all of the hoops that Corrections was asking them to do. So we'll have more discretion about what that looks like and everybody gets training and we do a screening. And so there'll be a different application process and an interview process for anyone who has a criminal history, but it'll expand who we can work with, which I think will be a great advantage as well. Does it take a long time to get uh, do get fingerprints and get, do a, get a criminal background check these days? Um, it didn't take long for me when I was hired in 2020. <laughs> I just went over and, and Eric did my fingerprinting for me. And that was that I had already, I had already been um, screened by the Department of Corrections because I had been with the Hardwick Area Justice Center for 13 years. So I was, it was easy. It seemed to be easy. I don't know what it looks like now. And I haven't had a chance to reach out to Eric to find out, you know, what that might look like and whether we'll be able to have our background checks go through this is new, <laughs> but um, it's, it, I just haven't had a chance to explore that yet. This is new information from like two weeks ago for us, but we will, we're working on it. Um, working with our community partners, of course, is also um, an opportunity for us. Um, we have 
program participants who need to do community engagement, which used to be referred to as service, but we call it engagement because we want people to benefit from what they're doing if they're connecting with an organization in the community. So we send to parks and to uh, the cemetery a lot. Sometimes we have folks who are eligible to go to the senior center to help out. And we do have somebody who wants, really wants to do some work at the fire station. So we're going to make sure that we can get that person set up as well. We're working with Circle and the Vermont Network. Um, there's a, on a higher level, statewide, a process being developed so that we can process, do a restorative process. This would be driven by the survivors. Um, it's not in place yet and there's no funding for it, but um, we're gonna continue to have conversations with Circle to see what the local, process would look like in terms of referrals, support, training, and making sure that any of the volunteers that are working on those cases have um, all of the training that they need. We do outreach through community events. We're going to be at the Pride Festival this year. Um, we always have somebody go to Coffee with a Cop, and that is a really good way for us to connect with people who live in the community, get feedback, and uh, again, recruit new volunteers. Um, we continue to recruit and train volunteers again because we want to develop the uh, a more diverse cadre of, of our volunteers. Sometimes it's as easy as a front porch forum post and we get lots of responses from that and we might not get a lot of people signing on once they find out a little bit more about what it looks like. Um, but I feel really lucky to have a the Montpelier community really people are really willing to step up and work with us. Any questions? I just had a, a thought when you were talking about the schools. I've worked in the schools in Montpelier um, for a long time, and it is difficult to get into the schools. Um, but in Montpelier, we do have a, it's called MRPS Pi. It's Montpelier Roxbury Partners in Education. It's the caregiver group umbrella for all four schools. So that might be a good entry point for you to get in there. And we, I know, that group has hosted outside organizations for, you know, sharing of information and recruiting, you know, families yeah. and youth into their program. So that Great. might be a way to break down that wall. <laughs> sure, I will definitely look into it. Yeah. Okay, and anything else from people? Right. Thanks Thank a lot, Carol. All right, I apologize, folks. We usually try to get our break in at 8.30 and it's 9.08, but let's take a 10 minute break. It's now 9.18, so we're 9.19, so we're through our 10 minutes, so we can start up again with uh, the growth center application. Mayor, council, so um, what we're, what I'm gonna talk really quick about is the uh, authorization to renew the growth center designation and to apply for an expansion of the boundary. Just to, uh, in case people aren't aware, um, you know, most people are aware of the designated downtown, even if they don't know that name. Um, the designated downtown uh, in this picture here is the, the downtown core in yellow. And uh, so, it is um, most of downtown to the roundabout, out past the Capitol complex, a little bit down State Street, and then down Berry Street to the uh, to Granite Street. Um, and this is the area that's uh, most people would know Montpelier Alive. They do our their downtown organization. This is part of the state program called Designated Downtown. So um, it's it's the state started at, um, at the late 1990s of coming up with designations to help revitalize downtowns. Designated downtown and village centers were the first ones. And then uh, shortly thereafter, they came up with some other designations to help support the downtowns. And the next one that came up was the growth centers, which, so in 1999, the city became a participant in the designated downtown. And in 2009, we started participating in the growth center. And the growth center is this gray area Ignore the hatched area for now. We're just talking about the gray area. So uh, the current growth center extends from an undeveloped portion in the west, uh, which would be the Crestview area, uh, past the Redstone building, out on Terrace Street, 
behind uh, this little white area uh, above the number two of the Route 2. That's the, the cemetery. So from there all the way over to what we call as Sabin's Pasture. Uh, it goes south of the, um, the, the river to include a lot of the areas over there off Berlin Street. And if anyone's really quick and knows their zoning maps, these are all the areas that are either residential 6,000 zoning or higher density. Uh, these are really the cores. And the purpose of the growth center, uh, when you ad uh, apply to be a growth center, is that you're identifying areas in the community where we in the community want to focus at least 50% of our growth over the next 20 years. So that's um, our growth center boundary has was big and it got smaller and now it got a little bit bigger. And so this is where it's at today, but that's the purpose of this area. It's, it's meant to support the downtown by um, encouraging and trying to focus our development within walkable and bikeable areas close to the downtown. So that way we can support and enhance our downtown. That's really the purpose of it. We don't want sprawling down our highways. We don't want development in our in our rural areas, we would rather focus them in these areas that are really close to our downtown. Um, and the, the state provides a number of benefits to the growth center. So the municipalities will get benefits uh, as priority funding for state grants. We can also get technical assistance that other places, uh, other parts of the state can't get. So a growth center gives us as the city a benefit. It also gives um, property owners a benefit as well. Um, under the current law, there's uh, Act 250 exemptions for projects of a certain size if you meet certain requirements. So there are a number of, of other benefits. Um, one of the ones that we're kind of all waiting to see is the most recent Act 250 rules that were going through the, the State House, where uh, what they call Tier 1A areas would be exempt from Act 250 altogether. So, uh, and Tier 1A are your designated downtowns and your growth centers. So these areas would be exempt if that gets signed by the governor. I was just talking to Bill, we haven't heard anything about that getting signed or whether it's gonna get signed, but we will be keeping an eye on the news to see if and when uh, there's a decision on that and we can get some final, um, final information on it. So that is, that's the kind of the goal of where things are. The process, once you're in, in this, is that every five years you have to go through a renewal process. And so we are currently at, currently disappearing, but we are at um, our third, our 15 year anniversary. So we have to come through a renewal. Normally this would be a consent item, except that we wanted to have a conversation and get the, the city's approval to add two um, expansions to our growth center. And so um, the, the first one is uh, highlighted on the east, which is this area over here. Uh, and I can certainly zoom in a little bit more. Um, see if it'll let me get my... I have a mitt. Nope. So uh, it is this area right here, which is um, the Country Club Road site, plus the other parcel that we added into urban residential. So the, the purpose for us uh, asking for this is that one of the benefits of Growth Center is that you get priority, uh, you, you get uh, automatic location requirement for applying for a TIF, tax increment financing, which we've talked about many times as the key tool that gives us the revenues we need to build infrastructure. So if we want to extend water and sewer through the country club road site, we would need to have a TIF district in order to capture those tax revenues to pay the bonds. Um, this does not in of itself give us a TIF district. It just gives us the ability to take that next step. So uh, we've talked about this in the past when we were um, having some discussion of what would be the next steps with Country Club Road. Well, one was to get the growth center, get the zoning changed to give us the power, the ability, the zoning density sufficient to apply for this growth center designation. 
Um, so that is that will be this area here with the black outline uh, gives us the ability to potentially connect through to Sabin's pasture. Those plans will all be decided later on. The second recommendation uh, suggestion that uh, I am making uh, that I think we would want to do is to also then add in, we've talked about residential six and higher densities, uh, our residential 9,000, so um, our densities for our zoning, our districts are based on uh, the size of the parcel that is allowed. So 9,000 means you have to have a 9,000 square foot parcel in that area. If you don't know how big that is, that's about a little less than a quarter acre. So uh, 10,000 square feet or so would be about a quarter acre lot. So this are these are all zoned for fifth of an acre or less for zoning. Um, so plenty that qualify, those would qualify us for growth center. They are high enough density. These are all eligible areas. Obviously it would make our growth center much bigger, but it would allow projects to avoid Act 250 in these areas. And that can be significant cost savings. And just by way of example, um, your, your trigger to get into Act 250, if you're not doing an affordable housing project, is uh, nine units over five years within five miles. So you think about a, a normal, even a small developer in town might do a couple of three unit buildings and very quickly end up, even though they're just doing, doing a three unit building, it's gonna be their 12th unit over five years and trip them into Act 250. So they can play games with it and avoid it, but really, um, this would allow even our smaller developers to have the opportunity to continue to do development and, and not have to go through the Act 250 process. This is, these are the areas, these are the, as we say, the compact settlement that protects our rural countrysides. And um, a number of projects that are in these areas would also then be transferred if, if the state law is passed, um, our um, projects would then be transferred to the city. So we have a project in Isabel Circle that's working its way through Act 250, just got permits. Um, so we would be in a position where the city would be taking over administration of that Act 250. So any amendments would go through us and not through the Act 250 anymore. So, and that project is in the residential 9,000 area. So um, that's our, that's my request is that uh, we'd just like to get approval from the council to move forward with the renewal, which we would going to be doing anyways, but the uh, really it's to get the thumbs up approval to make these two proposals, Country Club Road, and to add residential 9,000, um, with one exception. One, one res 9,000 that is not going to be added in is Gallison Hill Road, which is residential 9,000, but it's not contiguous. You notice all these other pieces are contiguous to the downtown. Gallison Hill is not contiguous, and therefore we cannot add that neighborhood in. Um, but all the other residential 9,000s would be added to our growth center as of, in this proposal. Thanks, Mike. So to, to go back to what we've been working on for a couple of years now, the, the plan to move forward with Country Club Road, the plan we approved a few months ago was multi-step. First step one was the zoning. This is step two, and then step three will be to apply for the uh, tax increment financing, right? Correct. And uh, these are all the concrete steps we need to do before we have and, the ability and to do the engineering and due diligence work on the site. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and this doesn't rezone the other areas, but uh, but that is something that we could do in the future. To rezone which other areas? Um, we've talked about other areas that we might want to increase the density on. The, the, this by itself doesn't do that, right? This isn't a zoning change. No, this okay. this this is strictly um, for the growth center designation. If you get in the growth center, you are eligible for. As I said, oh, I I wasn't going to go through the whole list. There's a, there's a large punch list of all the benefits that you can do. Uh, we have talked about a TIF district simply for this area over here that would include Saban's Pasture. That's what's been discussed. Uh, 
the one we had a few years ago included all of the downtown out Barry Street and then up this way. So uh, at this point, it's it's would would not include all those other areas, but it it would provide, as we said, the, the Act 250 benefit to a number of projects, including the uh, the um, Habitat for Humanity. That mm -hmm. is residential 9,000. That that would be one that we as the city would make the decision on if that were to get financing and move move forward, um, as opposed to having to go also through Act 250. Uh -huh. Okay. Anybody else have have questions? Lauren. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um are there is there anything that um currently if you're going through Act 250, like will now not be considered because the city doesn't? Like are there, you know, Act 250 has the many criteria, which of course it can be frustrating for developers, but it's looking at a lot of things that the community cares about. Like, are, is this going to, I presume this will put more work on the city potentially for work that right now is being done for a bigger project that would go through Act 250. Is it, is it creating more work or are there gaps that are going to come that we're going to want to be more robust about how we consider certain things that we would have taken for granted that Act 250 would have considered before? Like, I don't know, our traffic analysis or whatever. Like, I know that was a big consideration for the Isabel Circle neighborhood, for instance. So just curious, like, what the implications might be on our city staff and anything that we might want to think about if we made this much of the community a growth center that would then be exempt from Act 250. Yeah, so it won't add any additional work for us because we would already do those analyses anyways if there was a if there was a traffic there'd be a traffic um our traffic study threshold is below act 250 so we require a traffic study at uh at a, at a lower threshold so we're already doing these these analyses um before it even even if it doesn't get to act 250 we're doing them uh, there are Act 250 criteria that don't apply in the city, and there are city standards that Act 250 doesn't do. So uh, it's it's kind of, uh, we protect steep slopes, Act 250 doesn't. We don't protect prime ag soils because we are the compact settlement that's protecting the rural countryside. So not building housing on a, on a piece of prime ag soils that's in our water and sewer area doesn't make a lot of sense because it's driving that development to other areas. So we we don't do prime ag soils that would otherwise be protected if the if we had to go through an Act 250 process. Um, there are probably a few other studies. I don't know how much of an impact it has. It certainly would have a cost impact. Uh, we don't require archaeological surveys before. If you have to do an Act 250, you're going to have to hire an archaeologist to get your archaeologist sign off. We uh, regulate to the map when it comes to wetlands. So if it's a wetland on our wetland map, then we regulate to that wetland, but we don't require an independent wetland survey. So there, there are subtle differences between the two. Um, the, the, the Act 250 process generally requires, we don't care what the map says, you still have to hire a wetlands person to go out and do the wetland survey and say there's no wetland here. Um, whereas we've skipped that step by saying, if it's not wetland on the map, we can always make a better map and adopt the new map. Um, but if it's not on the map, then we can move we we move it forward. So there are subtle differences. Thanks. That's really helpful to understand. Um, is is there any downside for? I mean, overall, I think this is like in line with our goal and everything we're trying to do. Um, but just trying to understand if there's any like downsides having so much of your city a growth center like if it well the, is there any is there are, are there any negatives to doing this other than i mean it it seems like you just talked through like there's some differences in the permitting process potentially but other than that are there our initial growth center when we applied when we applied i wasn't here uh bill was here in 2009 uh, it included more than what is on this map. So it also included the eastern and western gateways. So it was, it included, I think, 63% of the town. 
So it was really big and everybody was like, boy, this is really big. So when we came in for our five year re going to get uh, renewal, they said, you got to make it smaller. And so it kind of brushed down a little bit more than people wanted. And so we then came in and added Crestview back in and had a conversation about savings. And so we got an agreement with them to uh, allow savings to stay in and to add in Crestview because that is an area that had uh, almost gotten an Act 250 permit in the past, had roads that had been laid out as to how it could be developed. So that area was added back in by the downtown board and by the city and uh, the other piece. But following that, you know, um, we, at the time, we didn't have our zoning done. We hadn't finished that whole process. And, you know, kind of as things got concluded and we looked at where things are and where we want to encourage more development, it would have been good. All these areas meet growth center standards and yet they were excluded. So, you know, in light of the opportunity now to ask for, um, especially with the new state law, we felt it would be good to add these areas, but the areas uh, for the Eastern and Western gateways, we agreed, or I agree with the fact that they probably don't meet the smart growth principles that are what are the foundation of the growth, the growth center areas meant to support smart growth. Um, and even if these places don't have the fully built out, um, you wanna have complete streets. And while we may not have a complete street on every one of these streets, we have a street typology plan and a plan to build that out and make these complete streets. And because of that, you know, we we meet the the standard of um, being a growth center. So um, in order to, like we said, we just we just passed the zoning rules to allow six units on a piece of land, and if somebody comes in and tries to do that twice, they're in Act Two Fifty and a hundred thousand dollar permit so it's it's really it kind of puts a cap on all the the great zoning um work that we did it kind of puts a lid on it unless we've got a lot of individual developers each willing to do one project mm -hmm. which apparently we don't because it's not happening yeah <laughs> one other piece on that too born you know it, it's a fair question to say should you know so much of our community be in a growth center. But if you think about it, we are the growth center, right? I mean, it's it's us where it's going to sprawl out and the traffic's going to come. So, I mean, I think the whole big picture plan for the state is that the cities, the, the developed communities with water sewer are the ones that should be taking this, most of this growth. So this is basically taking all the areas we've already zoned that said you meet this and just saying, hey, let's get you the extra benefits that everybody else gets. So, because Mike came in with this to me too, and I was kind of like, "Really? That's a lot." But then once you know, I'm sold. Because <laughs> the plan is dense, compact right. development in cities, and not paving over all the countryside. Right. And we and our goal was encourage more housing, and this certainly does that. So. Go ahead, Lauren. Last question. Thank you. For <laughs> um. So so it sounds like then the process is. We approve something, but then you kind of have a negotiation with a state over approval. Like, but yep. I mean, so they've got criteria. We think we meet all these, and then they'll look at it and do their own due diligence on it, and then it might come back looking slightly different. Yeah. So the the process is going to be on by June third. I have to submit our application, which ends up being some fifty some pages, with all the requirements in it. Um, that will go to the staff at ACCD. Uh, Agency of Commerce and Community Development, and they will review it and come up with their staff recommendation, which is probably just 30 pages long of a recommendation that goes to the downtown board. Bill was on the downtown board. He got all these big, thick packets. And then the downtown board will review it for whether it conforms with the requirements of state law. And that meeting we anticipate uh, is going to be in September. And if it's approved, then it would go into effect at that time. And if not, there may be a back and forth that they would recommend some adjustments to it. Um, and either we would bring it back to you if it was significant or if it was minor, we may just work with Bill and 
and sometimes they just sit there and say, if we take out this, this, and this and approve this, are you guys going to be okay with this? And some whoever's sitting there kind of nods their head and either says yes or no, or we want to go back to our council. So, And chances are good I'll be inviting the mayor to go with us to the board so he can nod. <laughs> that sounds like fun. <laughs> Any other questions from members of the council? I see there's, we still have... Uh, Oh, and I can members stop the, sharing here. You see, we still have members of the public um, in attendance, and so I want to make sure if anyone in the public wants to uh, raise your electronic hand, I want to uh, give you a chance to be heard. All right, and so you're looking for a motion to approve this proposal technically to authorize us or me to sign the application as per these because mm -hmm. the application is not actually complete so once it's done mike prepares it i'll sign it and this would be what we're asking uh -huh. authorized city manager to submit the 15-year renewal application with two requests for boundary adjustments to add in the country club road and to add in the properties in residential 9,000 as uh, 9,000 zoning districts as identified on attachment one. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Motion by Councillor Heaney. Is there a second? second? All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thanks, Mike. We're next up to budget adjustment. Thank you. Um, I know Sarah will be coming up, but I, I'll just, I mean, I think it's pretty straightforward what we're suggesting, and obviously you can do with it as you see fit, but um, we have a couple things at play. We have our remaining ARPA funds, which need to be expended by the end of this year. So we really want to get those allocated. In addition, as you know, we were projecting about a $1.5 million budget deficit. We certainly made reductions to try to cut that, and we asked the state for $1.5 million to fill our budget hole, uh, and they gave us $825,000, for which we are very grateful, but it is, you know, it still leaves some holes. And then we do have the FEMA lease revenue that we received last winter that we have yet to allocate. Uh, and and we it's been asked that we hold, hold that in bay, uh, and and we have done that. We staff felt like we could pr bring this forward since the state just um, approved three point five million dollars for uh, elevating homes, and it looks like the the language of the bill is that will actually come through VEM and grants to the municipalities to allow us to manage it, which is exactly what we've asked for, so we can move it quickly. I think the real challenge is going to be finding people that could do the work in an ex expeditious time. And thanks to a really great suggestion from uh, Council Member Gill, I reached out to Barry City Manager today to see if we could maybe pull together a bid for all the houses in both communities. I haven't heard back. I'm trying to figure out a way to maybe if we get more work, we can speed it up and use, you know, get some incentives. Uh, so anyway. Those were the pools of money. Essentially, uh, what we're proposing by and large is either completing projects. So, for example, all of School Street is in. It was going to be phased in, so we get everything done, the storm line, the water line, paved, new crosswalk, all done this summer. Uh, that's a plus. Um, as we've told you, we've had no luck hiring engineers, so we're basically reconfiguring that into engineering funding, that which is, helps drive these projects forward. Um, the, the Barry Re Recovery Residence, uh, you had already approved that a couple of years ago. We just had never paid it. We actually just added 5,000. We, we reduced one line and added 5,000 in for the Commission on Recovery and Resilience, their plan on the emergency management plan. That was the ask. A lot of this was just, uh, you know, again, taking safety items, police vests, those kind of things that we had cut um, because of the budget cuts. And then, you know, because we didn't get fully funded for our budget, we still have some slight projected shortfalls. So we've got some in the general fund, some in the parking fund. And, you know, that's $400,000 or more total, which, you know, if we didn't have those, we could spend on more stuff or we could hold more in, in abeyance. So, the, so basically, you can see how 
So each category is laid out. The biggest thing I think you'll notice is out of the FEMA money, the FEMA lease money, which we, we have in hand, we are again recommending the 150,000 that we need to move forward with the TIF application, The all the things that we were sort of said, you all approved in a plan to do, but we haven't funded yet. And so somehow we've got to fund that. Um, and then you recall, we left $300,000 in ARPA for um, to batch the, the, the grant that still we're still working on for the Berry Street. So the 1.5 million and the 300 was $1.8 million grant. We still need to hold that money um, because we don't know the timing of the grant. Number one, we have to get ARPA spent by the end of the year. And number two, there's some question if that's gonna be a federally funded grant, whether we can match it with federal funds. So to be on the safe side, we just switched took the 300,000 out of ARPA and put it in here to hold it here um, instead. So um, that, so we, I'm sorry, the, the old, the rec center, you, we had the, the, to do all the um, systems work, uh, all, all that stuff. And it, when we did the presentation, so we've applied for a $1.8 million grant, 1.5 funded, and we have to have a 300,000 match. So we have held, when we did the budget adjustment act, we held 300,000 in ARPA still, our budget adjustment act, not the state's. Uh, we held the 300,000. So basically just saying, we need to take that out of ARPA just so that we don't run into match problems and put it somewhere else. So that's our proposal. Um, those are the funds we have available. Uh, there are still some projects left and we still left 61,000 at the end if there were things you all the other thing I would say is our plan is that if any of these things, and we think they might, if some of these things come in under the estimates or uh, the, the the shortfalls are lower, they would all drop to that bottom line and stay in that FEMA funding, that Country Club Road funding plot. So there would be more money there if we wanted to use it for whatever. That's where that would go. Um, so I don't know if you have more detailed questions, I will defer to Sarah, but that's the big picture. Well, well, one question that just jumps out at me is that tonight we decided to not act on the proposal for city bot until right. next time. So, so that can be held. Yeah. So we can we can approve this, but it, but still that's contingent on yeah. approval. And if you didn't that approve it, then that would just be ten thousand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the other items on here likely will come back in front of you just based on our policy and their dollar thresholds to be approved at a later date after they've gone through the RFP process. So as a um, counselor from District 1, I have heard very loud and clear um, the FEMA money that is being proposed in this budget, that that is very upsetting to the homeowners that are still dealing with their houses that have been flooded, they're living in, you know, houses that are down to the studs, or they're completely dis displaced. They have no homes. And so this was prior to me being on city council, but they came to city council and urged the city council to use this money to help towards flood recovery. Yes, there's money that is in the state, but is Montpelier going to be receiving that $3.5 million through the Vermont Emergency Management Association? Was that the allocated funds that was approved? So the, the allocated funds that was said it was going to, so it was going to VEM and it then to be granted to the municipalities. So municipalities meaning? Us and Barry. Us and Barry. Okay. So, you know, one of the things that the families that have been impacted that they, you know, I represent them. And so I feel it's really important for me to bring this forward to the council to discuss is that this money be used in addition to that state money to help with recovery. And one of the ideas that I uh, you know, threw out today was to elevate a home. There's only two or three companies in Vermont that are able to do that process. And right now it could be a two to five year waiting list to elevate a home and that is really unacceptable amount of time for when these folks are living in their house that are down to the studs and they don't have kitchens or they're living in a one-bedroom apartment because their house is unlivable 
And so I would love to explore using this $450,000 in addition to the split money of $3.5 million for Barry Montpelier to look at potentially, um, you know, out of state vendors to come in, in that, you know, community wide, you know, economies of scale, Barry and Montpelier to see if we can expedite that process of elevating these homes. And it might be more than $3.5 million with elevations and buyouts, but I want to make sure that we reserve that funding just in case, because five years from now to go through the FEMA process, to go through contracting with a company in Vermont is just, I just think that's not acceptable for our neighbors to be living in that type of condition and not having you know, a choice of where, you know, where to, where to raise their children and their homes. And um, if we can do everything in our power to help them, I feel like this money could be set aside to help those homeowners in our city and expedite those processes the best way that we possibly can. So obviously it's up to the city council, how you want to allocate the funds, you know, the city did not allocate this money for any particular use at the time we did get that request. They just, you just held it waiting to see what the state did. Um, and, you know, I certainly my heart goes out to everybody that's been involved. That's why we fought so hard to get the state money. Uh, you know, I'm not sure our money is going to speed up, is going to create any more contractors any faster than state money. And I, the good news with the way it's allocated is it will be coming to us. It will not be a FEMA process. So we can move it much quicker uh, in that regard. And um, you know, we haven't specifically talked about this, but my impression, my thinking is that we would be doing worse first. So the people that you're talking about would, if money ran out, it wouldn't be for them. It would be the people it would be the homes at the end of the list where people aren't necessarily living. Um, so even if costs went up, I mean, the, they are the, 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 in our community, I can't speak for how Barry was going to do it, but for us, um, there are three active residential homes that we're aware of. And those would be absolutely the first ones we would look at before we did the other seven. So I, you know, I think if we get the money, that money is going to them. There's no question about that. Um, and, um, Otherwise, we can we could put stuff on hold. I mean, the council can decide what what in here you don't want to do. Um, I think if I would say this, this I don't know if you all would agree. My take would be if if we could actually get work done, like if they could get someone in and and the state allowed us to advance money and then take that money, I would could say sure, let's do it. These people are really in terrible conditions. I, I don't know if that would be allowed, and I don't. So, so I don't. I'm not sure what holding our money is going to get the the individuals if we can't get someone to do the work in a timely fashion. Whether we get whether we hold a million dollars for it, right? So, um, that's just my take. But uh, you can guys, whatever you want to do, we'll do. We would have to move, assuming we wanted to continue with that rec center match grant to, to redo all that building, uh, the system electrical and um, HVAC systems and all of the energy systems, we'd have to hold that $300,000 somewhere. So we'd have to look at other things on this list. Yeah, that's, that's the question that occurs to me is, is there any assurance that this is going to get the work done any faster. You know, we we got the three and a half million from the legislature, and and I know there was a long time where we we're thinking, well, it's probably going to come, it might not come, but now the money's there. Um, I mean, I'm just I one of the three point five million dollars, and it's not, it's you know, I think from what I've kind of understood understand and I'm not an expert in this at all but you know it's not the necessarily the speed well I think it's the speed and the cost of potentially contracting to outside um you know organizations that elevate these homes once you go outside of Vermont the cost like increases substantially so I would love to understand a little bit more about the budget implications of 
do we wait two to five years for a Vermont based company that stays within that original budget? And then what if we went outside of Vermont? Does the cost increase 10%, 20%? If it's 10%, could they do it in a year? And is that worth it? Like, you know, I would love to explore that cost benefit analysis and, you know, have that extra $450,000 if we go over $3.5 million for Montpelier and Barry, it's it's really going towards that expedited process. Um, if that is the case, I don't know the answer, but I'd so, love to figure it out. Yeah, I mean, none of us know the exact numbers. What I can tell you is that the the $3.5 million we had at, at least as we was discussed in the legislature, I mean, you never know how it's going to actually come up, yeah. was $2 million for us and $1.5 million for Bayer. And for us, that was 10 properties. That's $200,000 per property. Uh, the estimates we've been seeing were about 150000 So we had actually gone high. If it went to 250000 which would be, you know, 100000 up from two one fifty, we'd be able to do six properties or seven properties. You know, it, it, I mean... What's two million divided by three quickly? Eight hundred thousand? No, six hundred thousand, right? Six hundred thousand. Just on this. So, so you know, up to six hundred thousand would still get us those three properties, um, the three most crucially hit properties. It's hard. I, it's hard to imagine. I mean, at some point, then we might say six hundred thousand to save a. You know, is that is that really the cheap? You know, this whole cell was to be able to keep housing units at less than building new. Um, so I, you know, I can't tell you what the delta is, but even if you double the cost of what we're seeing from Vermont, it would be $300,000 per unit, and that would still get us eight, eight units, seven units. So, I, you know, it seems highly, I, I can't, it's hard to imagine a scenario where those three homes that are the most critical need, and Mike, you look like you wanted to say something, um, wouldn't be funded under this. Yeah, I guess the other points, that, the other pieces I would put in there is that for homes and almost all of the ones that we're talking about that have NFIP flood insurance, they would also be able to apply for what's called increased cost of compliance, ICC, which is about $30,000, which is additional funding, thirty to 35000 which are additional funding to elevate houses. That's not enough to elevate houses, but that's if we have the other money so now that we, we have a two hundred thousand dollar project to elevate the house we may only need to provide one hundred and seventy thousand because we would certainly be asking them they can't use the money for anything else you can't use it to fix your house you can only use it to bring your house into compliance doing things such as elevating so if we're going to give you one hundred and seventy thousand we'd ask you to apply for your icc put that towards the project. We now have spent 170,000 to do a $200,000 building elevation. So we we know of a lot of ways where we might be able to to get a little bit of money here and there. The idea was when we did it was the 200,000, 10 buildings, $2 million. The hope was that we actually might be able to do 11 or 12. Now, if we have to go out of state, I don't know. Um, but again, if we're also talking about a group, can we bring in one firm and bid out three buildings. Uh, we know we've got three buildings in a row that all need to be elevated. Might make sense for us to work with all three of them, do all three engineering plans, all three site plans, all three landscape plans, and engineer to elevate and move all three buildings or elevate all three buildings at the same time and maybe get, you know. Economies of scale. Economies of scale. If, and, but we won't know until we actually get in get into it. But, but yes, our priority was to target um, the ones that were substantially damaged, and so the the three that Bill was referring to would be the first ones that we would be putting um, RFPs out for. And, and in this situation, is the uh, are the homeowners expected sort of on their own to find the elevation contractor and do all that, or are we doing all that? We have to wait to see what the what comes out all we know is money's going to vem and it's going to get subcontracted to us we don't know how that would work um it could very well come down that we're doing the management of of the contracts on those to do the elevations um but and our goal would be to help them in whatever yeah i mean if, if somebody came forward and said they already had a contract 
and they met the guidelines, then we might go through and say, all right, we'll just, you know, we'll, you we'll track it and make sure you continue to comply with the grant requirements because there's going to have to be a subcontract that goes through and says, yeah, these are the requirements you're going to have to meet. And if you meet these requirements, we'll cut you the check that covers the, those costs that are a part of it. It's a lot easier for us. And I'm sure Sarah would agree. If, if money's coming through us that we have to manage, it's a lot better for us to be paying the contractors than it is for us to be paying the property owners to pay the contractors because if the contractor never gets paid, then what? <laughs> so. Tim. Now we can see how things happen. <laughs> there's just so many layers and, and there's so many unknowns still nine months later and these people aren't in their homes. Um, it's, and they did come and talk to us and we may not have voted on a commitment, but boy, we sure nodded our heads and offered a lot of sympathy and said we'd support them. And I, I, and I really think we need to, I'm not done. Oh, sorry. So, and I think, so I want to work through it, but I don't see how we can expedite the process with what I'm hearing. Um, but I also don't want them to get left out on the lurch. I mean, it, I mean, it, it really, they need to expedite it. Some of them have flood insurance, some don't. There's Each one has their own variables. I mean, even if we left the money and at least enough in there to have some guarantee so that by some point, if FEMA hasn't come through, which it sounds like they may, and they may not, there's a lot of weasel words in every one of these things. Nothing says they're going to get the assistance that I've read. So, so... I appreciate all the concerns and I agree. I, you know, the, the situation is horrible. We said we'd support them and we, and I mean us personally, the mayor, I, other people stood, got up and advocated pretty hard with the legislature and pushed and we paid a lobbyist to do that. And we got the state, this is not FEMA money, the state allocated three and a half million dollars of their general fund money to go to Vermont emergency management be sub granted to bury a billionaire for us to elevate these people's homes. That's exactly what that money is for. And the, the, so the, so 100%, it was because we pushed it. it. They wouldn't have just given it to us. So I'm not trying to claim personal credit. All of us, mm -hmm. the communities, I mean, the need was there. And, you know, if we didn't have any other money, I'd, we'd probably be looking at this differently and we'd be trying to figure what, what, what the struggle, as I understand, is finding people to do the work in a timely fashion. We're, we're going to have the money to pay the workers. We're not going to, the question, us holding money isn't going to get a contractor there any faster, is what I'm saying. We're going to get, we're going to have $2 million to work with to pay contractors for this, if for nothing else. We won't be able to use that money for anything else, just elevating homes. Um, so that, that's all. I mean, I'm not trying to be at all disrespectful to the situation that they have here. And I was on board with us hanging on to the $500,000 if we needed it. And I guess my interpretation is we were successful in obtaining $2 million from Montpelier to put for this use that is not FEMA money. So it doesn't have as many strings and, um, and fought, you know, we got pushback from, state administration saying these people could get FEMA money. And, and our argument was they're going to have to wait forever and go through all these hoops to get it. We want them to get it now. And we got it now. Um, you know, I mean, what, what we choose to do, I mean, I think, and again, it's, it's your choice. You're the, you're, you get the vote. I don't, you know, we also, but I also want to be clear, we adopted a plan also to move the country club road project, which would be to provide more housing for people. And we said we knew we needed one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for engineering and TIF application, and we did not at that point. The motion, I think, was the suggestion was to allocate it from this money, and we didn't do it then. So we've taken the second step tonight, approved the growth center, um, and we've approved a plan that requires this work, but there's no funds anywhere for the work. So if if you want, and and we've approved the application for this grant for that building, we were pretty excited about the idea that we could get all that work done for only $300,000. So it's great if we want to hold the 450,000, we just have to take 450,000 out of the other items uh, if we want to keep those in at bay. And that is certainly a legitimate policy choice. And all I'm trying to say is I would not have recommended the use of the FEMA money if I had not felt that we, if I had not known we had the 2 million from the state to help those exact people. So that's, that's what, where this recommendation came from. So it's covered. What's that? So it is covered. The cost is covered. It's just getting the labor. Yeah. 
It's how fast we can get them. Okay, I wasn't clear on that. Yeah, sorry. You know, but and and I got that. I mean, because yeah. it, it's not. We're talking about the FEMA lease. That's the lease that we got that was actually going to pay for water line. That was remember the FEMA paid us for the the use of the country club roof for the the trailers that never went in, and it was going to be one point one million for water lines. So we got half of it, so we have the cash in our bank account, and we came to you with the plan to use it then. And folks came in and said. We may need this, and you all said, "Right, let's hold on to it." And we said, "Let's see if we can get state money." And so we held on to it, and we got the state money. So, I, but it's you know we can hold on to it longer. That's fine. It's just something else won't get done. Lauren, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, part of I what I thought I was hearing from some of our neighbors was like lack of certainty, like concerned that the 3.5 million was a statewide grant program. And so, I mean, I, that had been my understanding. So it's good to just hear it again. So 2 million is earmarked for Montpelier. So this is not like it's going to the state and people are going to have to have some whole other grant application process to the state. So the, what we, what we anticipate right now is that, but, the but criteria was communities that, that had housing in a certain situation of which us and Barry, I think are the only ones, the only that ones that qualify. That, right? Is that, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that's, that's what Maggie said. It's not, they, they never write state laws that yeah. cleanly. They'll just go through and kind of write some up two sway, but it was 3.5 million. That would be going to VEM for communities that had XYZ criteria. And we are the only two that my understanding is we were the only two that met it, that met that requirement. So, and, and that was the yet yeah, the legislature had create a fund that only two cities get get to use. And it was really the stories of the homeowners that I mean they sold their own stories too, and and from both communities. I mean people. Yeah, I mean even I, yeah. So so I mean I'm I'm wondering like I feel. You know, this whole time it was like, is that money actually going to be there? And like now, you know, the governor's actually said he's going to sign the budget, we think. So, you know, so it's it's looking like in a couple of weeks we'll know, yes, it's there. Yes. And hopefully we can get clarity soon. So, I mean, to me, I think trying to pull together, like, what are the conversations that we can facilitate to try to like pull people together with like, what are those, is there outreach that the city could be helping with? And I love the idea of the partnership with Barry since like we're all in this together of like, you know, is there some outreach to contractors that the individuals don't have to be doing that themselves and, and that kind of thing. So I, I think like that kind of the maybe work and support that we could do and get Pat Moulton helping us from, you know, as our central Vermont recovery officer, like let's get some people focused on addressing the issue of how do we get people here more quickly um, cause I do think we have the money now. It's just a matter of how do we get contractors here as soon as possible. And so like, what are the barriers to that? And like, how can we help or who else do we need to bring in to help with that? Um, that I seems critically important. I, I think one thing with the contractor piece is one of the reasons I think we were successful after the flood, getting things done is we made a commitment to being down on the sidewalk every week and paying them. No, I'm serious. It sounds really old school, goofy, but it, it really helped. You have people coming in. We've got to find a way to cut through all. There's just so many layers here and red tape. And if people submit a bill and they do the work and we get it inspected, pay them. And I think if you find you get a reputation for doing that, you will find you have contractors that will do the work. But they don't want to get tied up with some long thing where maybe they get paid in four or six months when it goes through 16 offices and seven people get to talk about it and three others leave it in a pile on their desk for a while. It, it, that's exactly so we why we them. asked for it to be granted to the us and not but even us no, we, we, can, we can turn it around especially in an emergency Mike I guess the, the one issue that we've been looking at getting to what can we do right away so Josh and I have been trying to you know so much of it for us is we just need to know the rules mm -hmm. and so we're trying not to get um, ahead of ourselves uh, some people are spending their own money right now, and that's perfectly fine for them to be spending their own money. Um, maybe they'll get reimbursed. Maybe they won't. What I don't have is a big budget of money to be going and spending that 
maybe we get reimbursed and maybe we don't. I mean, we've got money to pay for, for example, to the 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 preliminary steps you're going to need for a basic elevation is, you know, we're going to need to get uh, uh, elevation certificates of the pre and the post, what we expect for the post, and then engineered drawings of the foundation and what the final plans are going to look like for the landscaping. We don't care what the renovation of the house looks like. We need to know it's going to meet the flood codes when it gets elevated and put in. What are the designs? What are you doing? So we can review them and get them approved. Well, that costs some money, but we don't know yet from VEM, who doesn't have the money yet and doesn't have the rules yet, can we start now and get reimbursed? They don't know. And, and if somebody could say, yes, we would be working tomorrow with rounding up architects to get those designs ready, because most of these are going to be pretty straightforward projects. It's They're not complicated. We're elevating a house. The hardest part is lifting up the house, but that doesn't need the permit. What needs the permit is how big is the foundation? Where is it located? Does it meet the setbacks? Um, does it meet the, the flood hazard requirements? And we can get those put in, we can get the permits issued, and we can be ready to go. Then we just have to find somebody to do the work. Um, but from our standpoint, we're just waiting to see what are the rules? Can we, can, can we start now? And once we know the rules from VEM, which hopefully as soon as everything is signed and the ink is dry and we know this is what's going on. VEM will be able to work with Bill and work with Josh and myself, and we'll be able to identify a path for what the, the sub-grant to the cities would look like and what requirements they're going to put on us so we can then turn around and say, okay, we got our grant agreement. We can now spend money legally. We can spend some of that money on behalf or working in conjunction. We'd work with the property owner to say, you don't need to hire the architect. We'll hire an architect with you and an engineer so we can do the elevation certificates, we can get the designs done. You have to prove everything obviously, cause it's your house and your property. And that takes the burden off of them to do the RFP process. Cause we can't just go out and hire somebody. And that's that's tough for a homeowner to tell them, oh, we need three, you know, three solicited bids and everything else. I mean, maybe FEMA's or maybe the VEM says it's whatever the city's requirement is, in which case we can work within our own procurement policy if it's less than a certain amount, we can target. Um, do you do three bids. An amendment to the policy and say under emergency circumstances or whatever for these things, this is what we're going to do. If they come in and say, nope, you've got to follow state guidelines per this this bulletin and that bulletin, then we're going to have to read those bulletins and find out what they are. Um, so that's what that's what we're waiting on. Is we now know we have the money, waiting for the ink to dry, so we actually can celebrate this um, and then. Tell us the rules. We're we're ready to go. Our office is ready to go, and we'll we'll figure out how to get the developers here once we've got. And I think if we had a if we have our, our bucket of money, there are going to be people who are going to be interested in because there's a certain assurance that you're they know they're going to get paid. Um, there's a there's a value to that because we've already got the money. We just have to allocate the money to elevate the buildings. And if you're a building elevator, why would you pass that up? Um, you'd probably prioritize those projects over a homeowner who may or may not pay you in a timely manner, so. Or a government entity. What, Tim? <laughs> Do I need to catch that? Uh, just, or, or maybe a government entity that doesn't pay you in a timely manner. I guess that's what I really want to ensure against is that we're not that. Well, we don't, we're not gonna be that because we're not going through making people go through what FEMA might make someone go through, right? Okay. Adrian. So, you know, this will go through Vermont Emergency Management, which is another layer of bureaucracy that they will design rules and regulations that we will have to follow. We don't know what those rules are yet. You know, the the governor hasn't signed in ink this whatever bill that budget budget <laughs> um so it's not like a hundred percent i mean we're pretty confident that that's going to happen but it's still going to go to another government entity that we're going to have to follow the rules we're going to have to develop processes to ensure that we're in alignment and agreement with what they say the rules are my question is with this fema money what are the rules if we used some of this money to help towards 
expediting the elevation of some of these homes, which is $450,000. There are rules. It's our money. There are rules. It's our money. But even if it was the architectural work, the engineering work, getting the basics done, I mean, that would be a lot less than four hundred fifty, but it would help get everything ready to go as soon as we know there's money. Well, the question I have is that what I heard from you at the beginning is that the what's causing the delay is it's going to take a couple of years or more for the contractor. So saying, well, people we're going to be pe people are going to be tied up while. Vermont Emergency Management develops their rules or criteria or whatever they're going to be. It it that doesn't seem like what the problem is to me. Those are Vermont contractors. There there's a, a there's a a long runway to get them onto a project. From what I've been told, we should definitely fact check that statement. Um, but is there a shorter runway for out-of-state contractors? I think we should investigate this. We don't know. We just don't know the answer. And if there is, you know, with this FEMA money, there aren't rules. Like, could we be starting this process now without any rules, regulations, kind of, you know, going back and forth with VEMA to just start these conversations, get a contractor on a calendar, start the you know, all the reports that need to happen. I mean, this still could take two years, but, you know, if we had seed money to kind of get it started and maybe we do get reimbursed, like, I don't, I don't know, but I think this is something I strongly encourage us to just kind of explore these options before committing this $450,000 to REC and CCR. Lauren. And um, I mean, two questions. It seems like the budget, like it's worth sitting down with VEM as soon as possible. Like we don't need to wait till literally the budget's been signed to have that conversation of what is your expectation? What's your plan? What's your timeline? Just so we could understand that. Um, I mean, my guess is none of this money is going to be, no checks are going to be cut before we would get that answer. Even if we were like tentatively you know, this DOE grant that I don't know the timeline for that and the country club road that's sitting there for future allocation. So we're not going to be spending this money. So even if we approve this as like a potential path, assuming the 2 million is going to come in soon and we can get started on stuff and maybe even VEM could say, yeah, go ahead and get started on the engineering and do that stuff. Well, we, we will write the guidelines in a way that that can be reimbursed as long as you know like yeah Mike if, knows what he's doing it'll be fine. If, if that was the case that would be great and we would be all over that I think so that that's really the crux of the problem right is that the lease money is ours and we can really use it for anything the money from the state the two million dollars 3.5 million can only be used it's not like if we spend our money now we can then take the state money and use it for something else unless they tell us we can't like we need a specific approval for that it's it's not fungible money it is for one purpose and one purpose it's actually clearly written how many even up to how much per home and all that kind of thing so which is 300,000 it's good there's a lot of runway there um so that's all so you know we and if if you want to use that that's great i would say that we have well, we we applied for a grant. I suppose we could turn the grant down, but they've actually already authorized us to do uh, some advanced work um, for the asbestos removal as part of our local share. So, so we've applied for a grant under the notion that we have the match. So essentially we've committed it from somewhere. And we've, uh, you've directed us to do a plan for a project which is going to take $150,000 that we haven't funded yet. So it, we, if, we, if we want to wait, that's great. We just, it'll just hold up that project. So then the other question is, okay, where's, 
what and that's fine there's um, there's more than four hundred and fifty thousand dollars on this list except i don't think we can use the arpa money for the match that would be the only caveat but everything else could be moved around probably but we would have to find four hundred fifty thousand on here of things that we don't want to do right i mean that's if that's our choice or we just don't do anything tonight and come back in another meeting and when with some information you can certainly do that um and maybe that's the thing to do um so i mean i think these projects are also very important and i have you know talked to bill about you know the country club road development and thinking kind of bigger broader fundraising opportunities and one of the ideas that I brought forth, and I'd love the council to just kind of hear this, and maybe we can get an update because maybe that $150,000, we could figure that out. But one of the things for Country Club Road, I think is very, very important for us is to think about Central Vermont, once again, is of how do we attract investors into this property? And so we have um, our hospital, we have Vermont Mutual, we have National Life, Norwich, habit darn tough right so all these organizations are having a very very difficult time recruiting you know senior to to mid-level um employees because we don't have housing we have a as we know we have a housing crisis we can help solve their problem and so i would love to see the city organize a ceo roundtable present this to the ceos and say would you invest in country club road could we get some of these organizations to help pay for this $150,000? Can we help them pay for, you know, the infrastructure for this development so we can take some of the money off of these budgets and redirect it by private public partnerships to help expedite the building of homes onto this property that we own? Um, and I think that is a strategy that's been used around the country. I think it's um, we would be solving a lot of problems for our organizations in central Vermont by building houses. They can throw national life on an apartment building. They could have priority housing, whatever it is. Like, let's have that conversation. And so we benefit by getting money. They benefit by getting housing. And we can start thinking a little bit differently about, you know, us always having to pay for some of these, you know, line items. Let's bring in some partners to to help supplement some of these line items in our budgets. It's a fantastic idea. I mean, this money is for engineering work that we need to do and then for a TIF application. And that, that would, you know, that basically lays out the feasibility of the project and, and then finding funders to actually build it, I think is a great idea. I'm not, I mean, if someone wants to give us $150,000 for all that pre-work, great, but I, I think the bigger sell is when we say we've got a project that's ready to go. We've got this. We know the water lines are going to cost X. The sewer lines are going to, you know, that's, I think, when you make that pitch is when, to me, is when we actually have a, a project to sell and that we can put TIF up. You know, we're meeting with VHCB really soon to find out if there's state grant money that they can put into this. I mean, we're kicking all the tires on that. Um, so, again, uh, you know, I just, it's, one hand, we're talking about trying to speed this up and move it, and the other hand, it's really whatever. Whatever we choose to do is fine with with me. It's really up to you guys. Um, so, just kind of going through the whatever these things are, the warrants. Um, there was a piece in here. Is that the same one hundred and fifty for Country Club Road, or is that because it looks like I, I just we hadn't talked about it and it was in there. So, oh, that was that was. Previously, that was the work we did for the all the pre-work to get the plan that we got and all the. Oh, all that's the like from way back when. Yeah. Okay, so we've got one fifty going out now for that, and then there's another one fifty we're going to do for engineering, right? Yeah, for, it's not the same. This okay. has already happened. I don't all know right, why right. this it's is just the same amount. So I was thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's just that's by chance. It's not so, and I, I do. I've been advocating for a long time to get the engineering going up there, so I'll support that. Um, I just was trying to sort these two things. Yeah, out. yeah, no, not not this. Well, the same project, but not. This coincidence is the same thing. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you. So I prefer um, deciding on this later because I think we are still missing quite a bit information. 
um, I have a tendency to use some of this money to support the people uh, who had some damages because of the flood. But I'm not sure that we talk about like uh, seed money and everything. But again, how much expense are we talking about to help them? So this 450,000 will be enough even as a seed money what is the like um projection so before not knowing the details i think it is too early to say oh keep this money or use this money for this um so i suggest we should discuss this again in the future like i don't know next meeting or uh, I don't know the, what's the best timeline uh, for rediscussion. Uh, it will be my comment on this uh, issue. Thank you. That, that's it. Sal, were you going to say something? Well, sympathetic as I am to the to the people who have really uh, are in a horrible situation um, and need need some action quickly on their homes and probably won't get it as fast as they want it. Um, there are a lot of people who didn't qualify for FEMA money, didn't apply in time, didn't weren't aware of the process, uh, abandoned it, lost their job, lost their car. There's been a lot of suffering throughout the city. I, I, my preference is to use the money where it does the most good for the most people. Um, I think that the DOE it would be foolish to turn down the DOE grant um, to help preserve a building that will serve uh, a large part of the city for generations to come. Um, to Lauren's point, we're not going to spend the money immediately, all of it. We're not writing a check for $2 million tomorrow. If if the situation changes with the $2 million from the state, you know, we can reconsider. But a lot of the things on this list are are deferred and have been have been painful to the city for years and years and years and we're finally we're finally able to catch up a little bit and i i think it makes sense and and i think bill and jack have done a lot of work with i mean i'm amazed actually that that the state said okay We'll give you the two thousand. You don't have to wait for FEMA. I mean, that is remarkable that they've done that. And if we're that close to to having it happen, I think we've done we've done a huge amount for for the people who've been um, most most strongly affected by this. So I I prefer to act tonight on it, and I would support it. Is that a motion? Yes, it is. <laughs> That's right. There is no motion yet. Right. I will move that we that we uh, approve the budget distribution. Is there a second? Seconded by her. No. Okay. What? I don't know the procedurally. <laughs> well, it's going to die for lack of a second unless someone seconds it. Uh huh. But we can continue. Uh, whether it dies or not, we can continue discussing. Well, maybe I'll second and then think about maybe a friendly amendment <laughs> or yeah. an amendment to think about. Okay. So then, so but, second, but so you're we about to ask it. a question. Yeah, so just timing-wise, like the ARPA money does have a clock ticking on it. Like we have to get that allocated and out the door, right? Like what's the, what's the timing on that versus the FEMA money sitting in the bank? And we can take time to think about that. Obviously, like if we approve the ARPA money, that means that's no longer an option to use for the 300000 Like I get all that, but like, What's the timing for the ARPA money? Okay. 
obligated by December 31st of this calendar year. Um, best practice would be to have it spent by then because obligated is not obligated by you all. Obligated is by written contract. So if something were to fall through or change significantly, we could lose out and have to return that federal money. There's not an opportunity to re-obligate after December 31st of 24. We technically have until December 31st of 26 to spend it. Um, it just leaves us exposed to a lot of risk. Um, and I am not as comfortable with that because we have a lot of deferred needs and this would help with some of that catch up um, and keep us in compliance and not have to return any federal money. And some of this stuff like getting School Street completely done, that's pretty big. That's that's a big a large chunk of the uh ARPA uh, proposal. You know, we've been hearing people come to us complaining about School Street and the water lines and the sidewalk and everything for a while now. Adrian, um, can there just be a little bit of explanation around the forty thousand dollars from a fence for behind the transit center from Shaw's to DMV? Just what that so means. The, we've been experiencing a huge problem with people going down over the bank. Leaving, tra you know, living down over the the bank, leaving trash, leaving human waste, etc. And it's actually quite dangerous for people to clean that up and difficult. And we've, we've our, our DPW folks have been doing that and without complaint, which is awesome. But we've actually been looking into see if hazmat crews or some other people can actually do this. And so the idea would be to run a fence to to prevent people from going down there and living down there and to try to preserve the riverbank but also the way you know manage the situation there is that um best practice to put a fence up i mean i just would think they would knock it down they might okay uh, yeah I... I don't know i have no idea i'm not an expert but yeah no well forty thousand dollars is a lot of money for a fence i was just trying to figure out was there research done or like other alternative options like what is the what was the thought process behind that proposal i kelly you want to take a shot at i mean we've we've tried a lot of different things we've talked to people we've asked them we've tried to move them we're putting up a sign that it's a no camping area We've talked about things we, you know, we talked about material we could put down that would make it uncomfortable for camping and then realize that those could be things that could people could throw. Um, and, uh, you know, we're open to any ideas that people have. We get a lot of, we, he we hear a lot about that section of the city and from residents, and it is the number one response location for our police and fire. Um, so. Is it the right answer? I honestly don't know, uh, but it's the best one we've got. So you know, we can wait on it and we'll continue to have the issues. And, and we might, you know, the fact is we could end up having the issues and all that stuff happening in front of the fence. At least it would be easier to clean up. Continue. You had your hand up too. Yeah, I, I agree. I saw that and struggling with it because we have the, River Conservancy folks pushing the Confluence Park saying how wonderful the riverbank is and we won't have these problems there and it's going to be so great. And now we're talking putting this long chain link fence up through separating. Well, it would be. It will include that area. Well, it would be. I don't know if it was, was it going to include the Confluence? It's from Shaw's to DMV. Oh, from Shaw's, right. Yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah. I, it just doesn't quite. No, I hear you. <laughs> so. That's right. I mean, that's initially what we had talked about. We also had been over to the site earlier this week to do a cleanup and, you know, potentially we might be able to shorten the length of that fence just to get sort of the most out of it. So that's also an option. I mean, I guess just would underscore that there are options. Um, and also, you know, we've been thinking about confluence part two. It's just we're trying to also mitigate some risk here, too. So it's just trying to think about what we want to do. We, we actually had a rescue down the bank and with two officers, it was next to impossible and then just a couple people. So trying to keep highly intoxicated people 
off that riverbank is a big priority. About 19 and a half percent of our calls are in that particular area. Is the fence the perfect answer? I have no idea, but we have to do something to to preserve the trash and the people going down there. And we don't have the capabilities to do the safe. The, it, it, the rescue that we did down there was not safe for us. So uh, to try and keep as few people down there as possible would help us a lot. Just one other thing. So at one point, the ARPA money we were going to use for a public restroom, are we thinking now with the rebuild that that's the long-term plan? So instead of putting money into using the ARPA money, that that could get rolled into the FEMA project? Is that why? I assume that's why. We have insisted here. on that without any of the options that we have public restroom here that can be separated from, that's an independent in place. We've got a few suggestions. You know, you saw a couple of yeah. ideas. We had a couple more too. If we were to reuse, the, even if we're not, we've even talked about the possibility if we filled in the basement, not filling in the front part where planning used to be, there's an outside door there and building that as a standalone basement that if it got water, I mean, it would fill up, we'd have to pump it out and clean it up, but it would just be that. And that could be a big, so absolutely everything, everything we've talked about has been predicated on it. There would be a public, permanent public bathroom in this area. Great. Just wanted yep. that on the record. That, that idea is not lost. It's just gotten yep. evolved given the flood and the opportunity. Um, I mean, I guess. Just back to the theme of money for a minute. I mean, I feel like I could approve this today, knowing that no money is going to be spent and knowing that we want to come back and like be having lots of conversations with VEM to understand what is that process going to look like? And then we could always revisit knowing that checks aren't going out immediately for this stuff. Um, you know, and I understand that that creates other, other holes then if we decided we wanted to use all or some of that money. Um, but I mean, to me, like we fought hard to get that 2 million, like let's, that's, that's plan A. If we need to do a plan B, let's keep that in mind. Let's not spend the FEMA money until like maybe part of the motion is like we nothing would be spent from that and without coming back to council to make sure that we've like double checked or that or that we I don't know the right way to propose it, but like like I want I want to make sure that we're not spending that before we have we know that the VEM money is like coming in is going to be there is going to be there they're not like going to take a year to do guidance or something and something unrealistic so maybe it's just maybe it's not a motion but just an expectation that that we're going to well, be you know the other thing is lot. i mean there's 61,000 left you could allocate that to beginning design costs or whatever for you know if needed to do or hold that in reserve, you know, to get this started till the money comes in. I mean, I don't, I honestly don't think it would be much more than that before we, act, you know, the big money's in constructing the stuff. So you could set that aside, you know, I mean, I'm not, I, I, the fence is an open question, but right, if you took the fence and that, there's a hundred thousand dollars that you could say we're allocating towards this need if, if it's needed, or we could come back and propose, you know, Get more information so you could you could move forward with the other stuff and still leave like a hundred thousand dollars pending our conversations with vem and those kind of things i mean that's the other thing is that the hundred fifty thousand dollars for the country club road development contract that's going to have to come to the city council to approve the contract presumably right, right. and so at that point we would be open for someone to say well wait a minute do we have this money? Do we know that we're set for, am I right about that, Phil? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it will be different contracts. Some of it's gonna be engineering work. Some of it's gonna be, you know, th this is total of all the different things that we estimate that we need. So it will be multiple, con at least two, an engineering contract and a TIF application contract. Yep. Um, I mean, getting us so we'll know by the next meeting whether the budget's signed for sure i mean that and 
we and it is like three weeks till the next meeting so we may have some clarity from VEM and I think you know talking to Doug Farnham talking to Pat Moulton would give us some you know sense of what they're thinking of how that's going to work so you know we might have more clarity about how that two million is going to work um, between now and then in the meantime you could hold off like I said you could probably keep some aside for those purposes, unless you had other things you want to use it for. Um, or hold, you know, I mean, all this stuff, oh, the, the fence is new, the city bot's new. Um, the rest of it's just the gate, you know, that's something that could wait, I think, you know, right. I mean, that's something we, right. We just don't want, yeah. Those are things that we can hold off on until we know more. Right. Um, Stump dump gate. Oh, that's down yeah. below. These are the things that aren't funded. Yeah, there the five hundred forty-eight thousand. There were several needs items that, that aren't were included. deferred that we could not include in this money. Everything at the yeah. so it's additional right. So the, so those are pending needs that we aren't funding with, with this. this. We all met as a leadership team, and then I went department by department to review all oh, the deferred yeah. costs and compile this list, and then we prioritized it based on what was the biggest need and a lot of it was deferred road maintenance and safety equipment and you know things that are getting difficult to do without or do with the old version so so i think um bill were you suggesting that we might take the sixty-one thousand that's unallocated and use it to get started or on the elevation hold it, or hold it for that purpose mm -hmm. until we find out what well, certainly we would hold it until we got right. clarity. Until we got clarity on the two million. Right. And it, ideally they'll allow us to, you know, they'll reimburse us for things. We I can can't do. imagine that they wouldn't. That's what I was sort of getting at. But I suppose they can do anything. I totally can. <laughs> yeah. They uh, really are big on uh prior authorization. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, uh, uh I think I saw you shaking your hand head there as uh, as Sal was talking. And so I'd like the with benefit of your wisdom if uh, you care to share it no i mean i was just the the concern was more about the the spending to spend money when we have if we got two million dollars we have all the money we need to do the engineering do the design work if the the two hundred thousand per elevation estimate covers all those costs all the engineering all the pre-applications to basically spend general fund dollars for things that the state is willing to pay for just because we don't want to wait three weeks just it boggles the mind to go through and say no it's it's we've got all the money to do all the work it's not a matter it's just a matter of us finding out when we can start spending the money and that's just a matter of having phone calls and so we've got a lot of needs you know we, obviously we we had discussions at the, the board about where all of the expenses would go and obviously planning had big hopes for having the money stay for country club road for the long term and it's pretty much gonna have sixty one thousand left at the end of the fiscal year that's the compromise that we're making but i hate to go and lose the last sixty one thousand that we've got left in that account because we don't want to wait for the state's money to cut us a check but i hate to be in the position of spending this money and then go into the state and say well reimbursement reimburses for that and say that's that's all that money's already gone you've already decided to pay that so out of that two million dollars it's now one million nine hundred forty thousand dollars right that's the concern uh, well i mean it's just the fact that we're not going to, we would not be able to re get reimbursed for certain money. That's, I mean, I think that's where Sarah is also thinking about it. So it's a matter of getting that official okay from the state. Once you've got the okay from the state, you can start spending the money and it's just mm -hmm. waiting for that to happen. I know it's the bureaucratic process that some of us live in and we're used to it. We're just like, we know when that line is and where that line is. We just have to hit that line. And when we hit it, then we've got we've got the money to do all of the work that we need to do to help all of the, the folks. And 
if we're spending money ahead of time, then we're spending our own money on something that we didn't need to. But this proposal just has 61,000 unallocated. So it's not like telling us to do anything. It's just that money's there. Yeah, my, my concern was when when Sal made the point of, well, we could spend that 61,000 in advance of the money. I'm like, that money is then gone. We then can't go to the state and say, reimburse us for those $61,000. That money is gone. We don't know. I mean, that's, I think part of this is that we're all, none of us actually know for sure. Well, and, and other people are suggesting we spend even more than that without any chance of reimbursement. So it's a compromise is all I was suggesting. But what is what on this list is in jeopardy if we don't act on it tonight? Is even the ARPA money in jeopardy? No, I think I, I, I we don't have DPW here. I mean, I think they've got to, I think the school street project, the sooner they know that's a go and they can bid it. And in fact, I think it may already be out to bid. Um, I'm not sure if that one is. The water line portion is out to bid. They're waiting for right. this approval right. to put this out the rest to do it. with it. So, I mean, that's really, you know, those kind of things. Um, everything else could probably wait until another meeting. So what yeah, if we amended? Except, except for the barrier the recovery residents that we promised them two years ago and we owe them. What if we amended the motion to approve those items and, and postpone approval of the rest until we have clarity or until next meeting, shall we say, yeah. ending clarity? Sure. And those items would be the uh, the first four items, right? The Barry recovery and the right. three school street line items. Um, it, it might be helpful for the meadow structures adjustment for paving as well. I know they've got um, mm -hmm. out to bid for that, but uh, to get that work scheduled and completed yeah, timely. Engineer. Yeah, so it's five, 530,000 dollars. Is that the total? I think probably funding well. So first, there's the other thing too is that really 435 thousand of this is also you know due to covering budget shortfalls that we that this budget adjustment act was for. That's we yeah. can't, that's not really optional either. I think the engineering services are really important for them also for getting projects done because this, this is they put out an RFP. They've got a bunch of proposals in for they couldn't hire a person, so now they're looking at getting an engineer of record for all the different disciplines so they can just call the state allows that to happen but so this is would all be then funds that were spent to develop projects that need to happen so that this that is an investment in moving infrastructure forward i think i think those would be the ones that really you know the fire engine bob mentioned tonight we're hoping to have a deal and actually you know that fifty thousand might be a different number so Probably better to wait till we actually have a real number on that anyway. So are are police running around with vests and, and firemen without air bottles? Or I mean for the next three weeks, or if we don't approve this, you're okay. And snow blades, plow blades. I mean, I know they gotta order them, but hopefully we won't need plow blades this summer. Mm -hmm. In three weeks. Right. Um so yeah, I think I think if you could cover the first four items, uh, five, 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 sorry, yeah, um, five hundred thirty thousand the in the top, and then one hundred and fifty for engineering services out of the budget adjustment act. Yeah, that would get something rolling. So so Sal, are you going to move to amend your motion to provide to allocate that? Uh, money and uh and, and do nothing more tonight and 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 uh table the and uh postpone decision on the rest of the list until next meeting mm -hmm. when we hope to have more okay is there a second to that motion any further discussion of sal's motion this is a motion to amend the uh original motion all those in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Okay. 
So you've amended the motion. The next question is the motion from Sal, and that is to, uh, out of this list, pay the uh, first five items under, I, under ARPA and the engineering services under BAA and consider the others at, at our next meeting. Are you ready for that motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, we're, we're done with that. Thank progress. you. Yeah, progress. Okay, <laughs> now we've moved the fire chief, chief update to the, uh, thanks, Sarah and Mike. We've moved the fire chief update to the end. There's no other business. Um, Mayor's report, the only thing I'm gonna, oh, the way it's listed, Weirdly, I'm I'm be listed before the council reports tonight, so I'll. That's wrong. Let's let's. I, I agree with you. That's wrong. Let's do council reports starting with uh, councilor Pearl. Just just reiterating. Uh, hope to see a lot of people tomorrow night, uh, Thursday the twenty third, six thirty to eight thirty p.m. Montpelier. Uh, senior center. There's also a Zoom option, at least for the first portion of the event. Um, so we can talk about flood recovery and resilience together. Lots of progress and lots of hope for good input from folks. Councillor Her or Count Cone. No report. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, no, nothing. Thanks. Okay. Now it's time for the mayor's report. And I was going to say that uh, I, I said what I, part of what I was going to say earlier, which was praise for our city workers. Uh, we've had some great events and we will continue to have great events, including Independence Day coming up in just over a month and uh, get out there for the resiliency and recovery uh, forum tomorrow night, city clerk. I think what I left for you all here speaks volumes. Uh, I don't think you need any other reminder about the coming uh, Board of Abatement meeting. You've got some materials, some homework there. And um, I have great faith that we'll be able to tear through those in a very efficient yet thoughtful manner. It is uh, the fourth Tuesday the 4th. The Tuesday instead of a Thursday this time. And that's because of a quirk in our charter requires us to meet then. So it might, might be good to just remind the people who aren't here that this is a good, this different day. Yep. Because yeah. I was just getting ready to enter it onto my calendar for that Thursday. But so yeah, we'll get something out. Yeah. To to everybody. Uh, Councilor City Manager's report. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, negotiation sessions with DPW. I'll get you a written summary. Um, we are next. We actually scheduled two separate meetings on the same day to try to get to the finish. I think morning and afternoon, take a break in between. Uh, well, we'd, you know, the contract expires June 30. Technically, we can go beyond, but, you know, everyone's kind of motivated. Um, unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, that's good. Unfortunately, it's the night before your next meeting, so I won't be able to give you a verbal update, but I'll... I'll send you a confidential memo on where we're at and what we're thinking. And uh, if there's any main concerns, we can, I'm happy to talk to any of you individually, or we can call a quick emergency executive session to talk about it. I don't think there will be. Uh, thanks to council member Heaney and Ke Kelly and others. Uh, I was asked to speak uh, at an event in Maine next Thursday uh, for the central, for the greater Portland council of governments and about flood recovery. And so they came up to do a little pre-video and they interviewed Tim and they interviewed the Downtown Association. I think Julia Watson from uh, Capitol Grounds, Kelly, just to kind of tee up the thing. And then it's going to be a question and answer thing. But I think, you know, I told them, I said, I, I don't know anything more than anybody else that's going to be in attendance. And they said, well, yeah, but you lived through it. So, so it's really just telling our story. And so I appreciate the people in the community that are helped also tell the story. And uh, so uh, we'll be missing a day next week. 
to run over to Standish, Maine to for the day. And that's all I've got. All right. So now um, I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. I move we go into executive session as pair one VSA 313A3 uh, to receive a briefing on the status of the fire chief hiring process. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Okay, the anticipation is that we will uh, just adjourn at the end of this and we will not have any further business. So uh, so where will we go to do this? I mean, we can, we can take a second while he closes down. As as and then we, we can just stay here. Out. Yep. Um, and no, and we'll, honestly, this isn't gonna take, I don't think, I mean, it might take long, but I don't think it will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So yeah, so what we should do is actually close out of this Meeting. and go into the uh, executive session link that we have. Right. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Well, I'm closing out of this and I'll see you in the other box.